Hello, beautiful people, and thank you all for joining us this evening. An, e an evening where I'm happy to say I'm joined by, uh, we're in, during which I'm happy to say I am joined by Charlemagne and the Prudentialist. Uh, we had hoped to have Furious Pertinax in, but he was uh, not able to make it. I wish him well. I hope he'll be back for the next possible stream we can have him on uh, for, as he's a, a friend of the channel and always a welcome guest. This evening, we will be talking about war in the Levant. Um, war, um, somewhat in quotes, I would say at this point, as I'm not quite sure that's a fair characterization, um, but uh, we'll explore that. Uh, a bit as we we move forward this evening. Uh, uh, I'm going to give these gentlemen a chance to introduce themselves uh, after I, you know, um, sing their praises a bit myself uh, and uh, to shill uh, anything that they might like to shill before we start. But I want to thank uh, any moderators, uh, moderators that are in the house. I want to thank the uh, Praetorian Chads who make this channel possible. I've been away for some time. I've actually had paying gigs, which have absorbed my time and attention. I apologize for that. But when the opportunity to um, squirrel away some cash uh, presents itself, I'm afraid I have to take it. Um, but I should be getting into more regular streaming here soon. Please do uh, follow these guys. You can see links for their uh, YouTube channels. They have other channels as well. Uh, you can check them out on uh, Find My Friends. You can find both of them on uh, on Twitter as well as uh, as and indeed on a number of other platforms. So please do follow them. Charlemagne's got great stuff. He's got a Substack going. Uh, Prude uh, as well. Both of them, in addition to the uh, in addition to this stuff with Twitter and their own YouTube channels, um, they're super duper um, mighty fine gents. Please buy my books. You can find links for them uh, below. So this evening, we're going to talk about uh, what's going on here in Israel. But be before we get started, gentlemen, thank you both very much for making the time to uh, join me in speculation this evening. And uh, do, do, do either of you have anything further you want to say to introduce your shell, uh, yourselves, any links you want to shill, uh, anything of the sort? Maybe uh, Prude go first. Uh, well, as always, Oliver, thank you for having me on. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Prudentialist. I usually cover international relations and politics. I'm your sort of geopolitical amphibian for all things going on in the world as well as history. Um, if you want to just find out what I'm doing or what I'm writing about, you can find me on YouTube as well as the Prudentialist.substack.com. I'm working on an article about how immigration is used as a weapon um, by nation states nowadays. So uh, a geopolitical lens to our current demographic crisis in the West. Monsieur Maine. Uh, yes, thanks for having me on. I simply urge viewers to uh, subscribe to the Old Glory Club Substack and YouTube channel for our weekly content. Well, hot damn. Sorry, I had to run over to my bookshelf just so I don't forget. Uh, Prude, uh, given the subject you just mentioned that you're working on, uh, please do take a look for uh, what's called Weapons of Mass Migration, Forced Displacement, Coercion, and Foreign Policy by Kelly M. Greenhill. If you don't have it, um, hit me up if uh, that didn't come across. It's Cornell University Press. Uh, I think you might find it useful for your purposes. Um, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I guess we have um, this, this this subject before us that I expect will be rather interesting to speculate regarding. Uh, maybe what we can do is start by uh, talking about our understandings of what has happened thus far, you know, as, as best we can tell, given the fact that all sorts of things, you know, from claims to uh, characterizations to context and the rest can be called into question uh, on both sides, as this is an information uh, war as well as a kinetic one. Um, I mean, maybe we can start with talking about what it appears has happened. And then after we cover that, up to what we know about it at present, we can move on to our thoughts regarding what it might mean. Um, I imagine both of you gents have, uh, covered it fairly closely. How would, uh, either of you start in, uh, characterizing the events thus far for those who might not know? Well, it's, um, uh, some call it a terrorist attack. It's somewhere between a terrorist attack and a 
sort of ragtag military invasion. Uh, Hamas seems to have killed hundreds, possibly over a thousand Israeli civilians. Um, part, some of them in this particular music festival that was on the border, whether or not, with Gaza, that is, uh, whether or not that was specifically planned or just happenstance, I don't know. Um, I've heard that Hamas, the you know militant Palestinian group um, in Palestine, has fired about something like five thousand rockets or something into Israel and seem to be, you know, taking some territory along the border uh, with the Gaza Strip. Uh, Which is isn't... also referred to as a Gaza envelope, a secure, a, 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 a band of territory surrounding it uh, by land uh, to the south, uh, east and north. Sorry, go on. Yeah, and th it seems that, uh, you know, they've uh, destroyed a few of the Israeli tanks. I think they even captured one. So, you know, it's kind of hard to tell. I don't want to overstate the degree to which it's like a big military venture because that's just not what Hamas is capable of. Uh, they've taken a few villages. Uh, you know, Hamas can't destroy Israel or something like that. Um, but so far, it's, it's this is much bigger than just uh, your typical back and forth terrorism between Israel and Hamas. This is a, a major attack. Uh, Israel has actually declared war, um, invoking Article 40 of their constitution. I don't know who they've declared war against. Um, maybe they don't have to declare war against anyone to be in a state of war. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's not really clear exactly what's happening other than that. It's a, it is a very, it's a big attack. Uh, the Hamas, Hamas is, uh, well armed with like, you know, man portable missile launchers and things like that. Uh, we've seen a few videos, not Arma 3 videos, but actual videos of them using these weapons, uh, against the Israelis. So whether or not this is going to go on for days, weeks, months, it's hard to say. I'm not sure how long Hamas can sustain it. Um, I've heard that they um, are open to talking about a truce. I have no idea if that's legit or not. Um, I've also heard the leader of Hamas was actually killed. Again, don't know if that's legit or not. Um, but uh, yeah, major attack. Uh, I'll stop rambling now. Well, uh, before I turn it over to Prude to get his take on what's there, I'll throw a few more things in. Um, correct me, gents, if I'm wrong, because this is constantly getting updated. New information is coming out. But um, just as a, just as background, this started uh, on the 7th of October, a couple days ago, uh, in the very early hours of the morning. Apparently, the uh, um, Hamas militants, uh, we are told, broke out of uh, the, the perimeter of uh, the whole Gaza settlement and uh, simultaneously did some things with some ultralights or gliders or something, and engine-powered, you know, um, heavier-than-air uh, vehicles, um, presumably just ones that carry a single person for each one. I, I haven't really looked. Maybe it's two. I don't know. Um, and simultaneously tried to do some amphibious landing stuff, uh, and they managed to uh, get pretty far out into some of the zones in the southern part of Israel to the to the north and to the east uh, of them. Of course, their immediate southern border is with uh, Egypt. Um, I understand that they've taken uh, a large number of hostages, uh, um, probably uh, in the, the scores, if not the hundreds. Um, but I haven't, I haven't, of course, followed this closely. Um, there are a number of uh, Israelis who are caught off guard. Apparently, we're supposed to um, understand that this is uh, was Yom Kippur, and uh, the the Israelis were asleep at the wheel in some respects. Uh, in some respects, uh, despite the fact that they'd been caught with their um, uh, pants down uh, after a fashion uh, on this very date, sometime in the past. Um, and uh, I will note also that, uh, as Charlemagne said, they're they're calling it war very quickly, which is odd because you know we'll call Vietnam a conflict, and the Russians will call what's going on in Ukraine a special military operation. But the uh, Israelis don't have uh, any problem calling something that lasts a few days uh, a war. Um, 
So in this case, what we have is a war, though I'll remind everyone that the major zone of conflict is, is about the size of Detroit and its suburbs. Um, and uh, yeah, there's much talk being made of how, how, uh, how this is, this is, uh, you know, the, the Hamas have, have an air force and the, the chief of their naval operations, you know, and, and, and basically we're talking about ultralights and, um, you know, uh, rafts with outboard motors and stuff. So there, there does seem to be quite a bit of, uh, emphasis on, you know, Hamas is this capable new enemy, which to me seems a little bit, I don't know, a little bit much, uh, at the same time, however, it cannot be, uh, denied that they've shown, um, a great degree of uh, coordination. Um, clearly, there was uh, planning for this for quite some time. They had to coordinate the various elements that have gone out. Uh, I have not seen anything uh, about the size of these groups that suggests to me that there are many of them that are more than about 10. You know, you'll hear about people holding up in buildings or in houses or taking hostages, and the, the numbers of these guys suggest, you know, a squad or two uh, at most. So, yeah, that's the 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 gist of what I know. Um, Prude, surely you've been following this. Surely there's some things that uh, Charlemagne and or myself have missed. What's what's your take on what, what's happened here? Well, it's kind of liberating to not be in the please pick a side camp of sort of deals. <laughs> Amen. I, it, I, I've noticed this sort of discursive retrenchment of like we must pick sides um, and also using leftist language over decolonization. Um, when you'll see certain Palestinians say, well, this is what decolonization looks like. And uh, those that are more ready to jump to their side, I just think that maybe we shouldn't be using the rhetoric of decolonization when there are so many rabid uh, groups inside Western countries that tend to be more white than not, that uh, you'll see want to use decolonizing the West. So it's something that pops to my mind. And this does come as a surprise, this entire attack. There was uh, a report from the Times of Israel earlier this morning, 11.26 uh, a.m., November uh, October 9th, 2023. So it's local time, I guess, for this website. But it says a uh, Cairo official says that Israel focused on the West Bank instead of Gaza, meaning it's more focused on Lebanon than it was the Gaza Strip or envelope. Um, Egypt's spy chief warned um, the prime minister of a terrible operation while Benjamin Netanyahu denies it. Uh, this does come in the backdrop of an ongoing political internal dispute within Israeli politics. Uh, there are two sort of big things happening in the backdrop. One, you have a very difficult demographic crisis wherein you know the only reason why israel's um tfr is above replacement rate is primarily due to the ultra orthodox uh jews with inside israel and then other groups that are more secular or less orthodox in their judaism uh not so much and so they're having the same sort of problems that all developed countries have with the decreased birth rate on top of this benjamin netanyahu has been pushing for what has been labeled as judicial reforms which would be strengthening his grip as well as uh, the Likud, you know, coalition's grip on power inside of Israeli politics, which is why you've seen a lot of concern that what's been coming out of him over the last few months prior to this attack was sort of power grabbing or authoritarianism inside Israel. And so now we have this ongoing conflict that has had uh, ultralights being used, drones being used alongside the usual bits of tunnels and smuggling and uh, infiltrating buildings and things like that. Uh, one of the big things that kind of comes in my mind in the backdrop of this conflict is how will this affect ongoing Mideast policy from the United States government? Whether you like it or not, unfortunately, America's uh, deeply involved in this Arab part of the world, and that there has already been a U.S. carrier strike group that is moving closer to Israel and towards the Mediterranean Sea, which raises more questions how that will affect, say, Russia and Iran's posture, as well as inside of Syria. Keep in mind that the port that Syria has is one of Russia's only warm water ports that isn't currently being as heavily occupied or heavily uh, guarded or watched over in comparison to, say, what's happening in Kronstadt, the Baltics, or in the Black Sea due to the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. You've witnessed um, a lot of Republican senators in the United States, particularly those like... Uh, Oh, I just was talking about him earlier, but I'll, I'll pull up the tweet. But he was saying that all of our, our funds must go towards, um, you know, paying for Israeli aid rather than Ukraine. This was Senator Josh Hawley. Um, so we're sort of robbing the collective Zinsky, uh, Zelensky to pay for the collective Bibi. 
Uh, on top of that, you know, there's been allegations that new fronts are popping up and that Hezbollah is planning, which of course is another militant group primarily inside of Lebanon, which has its own issues, planning to attack. But with U.S. foreign policy, you know, you have sort of the Trump administration's big deal, the Abraham Accord, sort of getting this more Arab-Israeli normalization of ties. Uh, understand that since 1948, we've provided more foreign aid to countries like that of Israel and Egypt to have better relations and to maintain their position in the Middle East and the Levant more than any other country in the world, or those two at least. And so to see the deterioration the deterioration between the Saudi Arabian and Israeli relationship sort of falter, as, especially as um, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has said that he's he stands with the Palestinians and that he stands with those that are being uh, attacked inside of uh, the Israeli territory. So you see this sort of great picture play out. Uh, the White House has came out with a statement saying that they hold Iran responsible and that Iran has provided supplies in towards these various terror groups such as Hamas and Hezbollah in the past, and that they say that they're doing it now. There have been unconfirmed reports that there have been strikes inside Syria, Iraq, uh, these various corridors that were supplying these groups and that they had been taken out by airstrikes. I can't confirm that at the present moment, but it really does illustrate that much like the beginning of the war in Ukraine, uh, your usual propagandists and your usual bout of war drum beaters and chicken hawks and the rest of them are falling for the same, either falling for it or deliberately posting it. My mind is always on the latter, posting things like Arma 3 footage, other Milsim content, um, and you know videos from conflicts that are like 10 years old or even 25 years old to prove a point. Uh, to sort of drum up support. So, I mean, as, as per usual, the, the various lobbies and groups inside America are making this a clear out, all hands on deck type deal. And this is the first time in 50 years since 1973 in the conflict that happened that year has Israel invoked its constitutional authority to be in a state of war. So this is unprecedented, at least in the last 50 years. There have been other conflicts, of course, that we've witnessed in the last 10 to 15 years but things are certainly different in how the Israeli government as well as the American government have responded to this ongoing attack. Well, that's actually the most interesting part is the uh, massive escalation of Israel's response in terms of declaring a state of war, which, as you said, hasn't happened since 1973, and also declaring that they're mobilizing 300,000 reservists to, um, to bolster their existing uh, military, which I think is about half that size. Uh, you know, this is the same amount that <clears throat> Russia claims to have mobilized for its war. Um, and this is a much smaller territory. So it'll be interesting to see if Israel actually does attack Gaza or siege it with uh, sort of overwhelming numerical superiority. Because, uh, you know, I, I think it's quite possible, started getting into speculation. Netanyahu said some interesting things about changing the Middle East with this conflict. It's It's quite possible that they do something like, you know, just take the entire Gaza Strip um, and annex it or something like that. I think we'll have a better idea of what exactly Israel is planning to do in this state of war um, in the next coming days uh, or even weeks. It's possible there's some very particular constitutional reason that they're doing it, or it's possible that they really are intending some sort of massive overwhelming attack that's going to sort of uh, end this situation once and for all. Well, it's before we jump to uh, speculation, which I'm, of course, eager to do, it being my uh, specialty. Um, I, I do feel like there are a couple other things that we should um, inquire uh, as to before we move on uh, with that. Uh, foremost among these uh, is the business of Hezbollah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, gents, and uh, everyone in the chat. Uh, I heard that on the first day there were uh, a few uh, cross-border artillery, whether tube or, you know, um, uh, howitzer or whatever. Um, there were some uh, cross-border artillery strikes in both directions between uh, Israel and Hamas. As I recall, uh, uh, some sort of uh, remote emplacement was, well, I'm probably confusing that with some of the Gaza stuff, but uh, maybe a radar emplacement was was hit in the, the north of Israel and the, the Israelis responded. But uh, if those are to be believed, um, since that time, 
Has there been uh, anything further from Hamas? I know that there was a thing going around on Twitter you mean that Hezbollah. reported to be Hezbollah. Pardon me. Yes, correct. Um, has there been anything further from uh, Hezbollah? Um, uh, I saw something going around on Twitter that claimed to be a statement that they're coming, uh, but I saw other people come in and say that shit was old. Uh, I haven't heard about anything other than those reports on the first day. Have you, either of you heard anything since? No, I've been following all the reports I can that often cover the Ukraine conflict, and it seems like Hezbollah hasn't made any major moves, which suggests to me that they were not uh, privy to Hamas's plans, and there's not some sort of two-pronged attack going on. Um, it, it seems like their support is more or less moral support at this moment, uh, with some token, you know, artillery attacks, but it's it's possible that Hezbollah um, launches some sort of bigger attack. Uh, one thing, though, you have to remember is, you know, uh, one uh, one country's Islamic militants aren't the same as another. So, you know, Hamas is a Palestinian nationalist group, basically, and Hezbollah is actually uh, pan-Islamic, so they don't exactly have the same ideological backing, you know, other than sort of yeah, having a Hez common era. He Hezbollah is Shiite, is it not? I should have this memorized by yeah, now. It's, it's Shiite. I believe it is. Right, which means that there are there are very real sectarian divides uh, and presumably uh, divides uh, between their respective backers uh, when it comes to Hamas and uh, Hezbollah. Um, so, yeah, so uh, I, I haven't seen anything in mind. on that front, though, uh, to answer your question in terms of anything remotely significant. The only thing I've seen has been a report that came out from both Israeli and Lebanese state media that there were a few rocket and mortar strikes that happened earlier this Monday um, that were fired into sort of the Galilee region in northern Israel that um, they had struck two Israeli command centers using guided missiles, mortar shells causing direct hits. Uh, they said it was, re you know, a response to the, quote, martyrdom of three fighters who were reportedly killed in Israeli attacks earlier on Monday. Uh, Reuters reported that Israel sent th uh, helicopters to strike targets and hit southern Lebanon um, after that cross-border raid had taken place. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that the biggest backer of Hezbollah, besides more radical um members inside of Lebanon is primarily Iran. And that's sort of been the big issue between the relationship and this sort of proxy conflict is, is that, you know, Hezbollah is backed by Iran, or at least it has been for the longest time. I, I think it was founded originally. Memory serves me right. I should know this um, by some former Iranian Revolutionary Guard members um, that were in Lebanon. Nevertheless, you know, the, the U.S. presence there this all weaves into all these other larger proxy conflicts. I mean, we have to remember, of course, that, you know, Israel's existence, of course, is anathema to just about everyone inside the Middle East for, for ethnic and religious reasons. Um, you know, we've been trying to normalize Israeli-Saudi Arabian relations. And while at the same time, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia and Iran have been ongoing in proxy conflict over uh, Yemen for over what feels like a decade now. And, uh, of course, trying to disrupt the relationship between Israel and Saudi Arabia seems to be like a very large win for uh, Iran in this instance. And this also has the uncomfortable backdrop of the United States government under this administration wanting to get a new Iran nuclear deal 2.0 to try and start that back up again. Um, and then... I believe there was a prisoner exchange that came at the cost of uh, several millions of dollars. I don't know the exact dollar amount off the top of my head. I can quickly look that up. But of course, that all leads back to internal domestic squabbling over what should a country of 300 million some odd people do about other countries halfway around the world. Um, one interesting thing, too, is is that Biden uh, decided to instantly blame Iran for the Hamas attack, whether or not there's any truth to that at all. Um, uh, that kind of has that's, that's right. Yeah, go ahead. That's a, that, Sorry, that's a good point. I don't want to stop you. I just wanted to say that's immediate, That's what I was going to turn to next. What is the current state <clears throat> of, uh, you know, in the various news sources of uh, where the the blame is being laid? Well, other than than that, I haven't seen anything other than, you know, blaming Hamas directly, which is obviously the case. 
Um, I saw I saw Gunter Fellinger claim that uh, you know Russian KGB is somehow behind this, which is obviously nonsense. Um, and we heard I, we heard Zelensky say that you know Russia is laughing with its Iranian proxies who are openly supporting these people. But I looked and from what I saw, Iran hasn't has has denied any involvement. Um, which you know is here nor there, but it's certainly not openly supporting, um, and uh, and I, I've not yet seen any kind of substantive evidence that uh, that Iran is behind this. Again, we're looking at a situation where Iran has a very effective um, uh, partnership of some sort with Hezbollah. They were, were quite successful um, by most uh, metrics or measurement standards uh, as of two thousand six. You know. Um, so, you know, I, I'm kind of wondering to myself, would, would Hamas sharing a, a border with Egypt and Gaza with historical relationships with, uh, Egypt and other Arab countries, uh, being Sunni, uh, you know, why am I to imagine that this would all be, uh, would all be Iranian? Have I, either of you heard anything convincing? No, I've just seen fingers pointed. Fingers pointed, but there is sort of a, a documented history of Iranian support for Hamas and Hezbollah. I mean, anything to sort of disrupt ongoing Israeli as well as American policy in the Middle East. This To say that they deny it, sure, but I, I think in the eyes of how history's played out, I'm, I'm not particularly surprised here. No, I mean, it's definitely fair to say that Iran has supplied them with weapons as well. I think maybe that's only the line that the White House is taking. We'll see. I think Biden is issuing a statement tomorrow. But, you know, there's there's sort of two levels to this. Um, you can blame Iran in the sense that you're laying the blame on them for providing the material support to Hamas, uh, you know, which is certainly valid. And then there's blaming Iran for the attack in a very direct way, um, as in they, you know, supplied everything for it and helped coordinate it and, and all of that, which I don't, I don't really see how... Uh, U.S. or uh, Five Eyes Intelligence or Mossad could really know that at this point. Yeah, how could they know it and yet have uh, you know uh, suffered a terrible, terrible intelligence failure? An intelligence failure so often hammered upon uh, at this point in the last two days of coverage that it reminds me of nine uh, eleven. A lot of was just, I was just about to say that. <laughs> yes, no, I mean, I think that's the one part of this that's obvious nonsense. I mean. You're telling me that um, basically the best intelligence organization on the planet who is basically, you know, tasked with monitoring what's effectively like Stone Age people with AK-47s somehow didn't notice that this was going to happen imminently. I mean, the president of, or, or I don't know if it was the president, uh, who was the official in Egypt who claims to have warned them? You know, we don't, we don't know. Intelligence chief. We don't know if that's true or not. I mean, anyone can say they warned about anything after the fact. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not buying for a second that this is like intelligence failure. Uh, kind well, of, it, we... it kind of reminds me of the Israelis saying that they warned us prior to September 11th, <laughs> 2001. Which, I, I... which which might not be a coincidence. Yeah. No, I, I I just feel like this is a, a, a global war on terror. It's a G-Watt throwback. I mean, we, we've witnessed... Uh, more conservative and neoconservative individuals and sort of the right wing and American GOP, uh, GOP and politics saying like, hey, the southern border is going to, you know, it's got millions of people. There could be terror cells just very similar to what happened after September 11th, 2001. Uh, you're you're seeing the need to, to stand by Israel and to do everything that's necessary to, to wipe the slate clean of radical jihadism. Uh, you know, jihad isn't a word I haven't been seen used in sort of the mainstream political discourse in a, in a hot minute. So it, it feels like we're just cranking that that old G Watt sort of uh, record back on the back on the record player. Yeah, it seems like it just did drop again. And we're going to get to hear about all of it again before we get to uh, some context that I think is important before um, we turn then. Uh, to this business of a quote-unquote intelligence failure. I do want to um, point out that uh, Academic Agent uh, posted a tweet a few days back, and I agreed very much with the sentiment of it. He was saying, basically, you know, everyone thinks that they're just going to rerun the same old thing, that it's going to be, you know, election fortification, that it's going to be coof. Um, 
and uh, and these sorts of things. Uh, but these people tend to, um, you know, they they tend to come up with uh, other things. You know, I did not expect the coup when it happened, and I certainly didn't expect uh, a land war in Eurasia. Um, and now we have uh, the return, uh, as you pointed out, Prudentialist, of a whole set of themes that we haven't seen uh, in quite some time. So I wanted to you know, call out Academic Agent's tweet. I tend to agree with it, and I think we should all have our um, eyes uh, turned towards the horizon for um, things that were not expected. You know, we have this business, of, who was it? Blinkett Prude will know. Is it Blinken or one of these uh, uh, functionaries or handlers or whatever of Biden uh, appeared recently and said that the Middle East has been the most quiet it's ever been in quite some time. And then, pow, this happens. I do recall, because I was alive at the time, and Prude, since you follow Stratfor stuff very closely, you may remember this too, even though it's a little before your time. Uh, just before this, the stuff happened with the twin towers and everything else, there were all kinds of things being discussed on Stratfor because I used to read the website about how the Middle East is turned into a kind of quiet backwater without great geopolitical significance. And then pow, uh, we had, uh, nine 11. Now we have people saying, oh, it seems like it's going to be calming down. And then pow, we have, uh, we have this. Do you remember, remember it, anything about that? It was the that National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. It was reported just Sullivan. Days that's ago right. That Sullivan, uh, the Middle sorry. East has been the quietest it's ever been in the last twenty years, because uh, of course we invaded twenty years ago in Iraq in two thousand three. But yeah, no, I, I agree with Academic Agent's take on that one. That they everyone. What's the old Ernest Hemingway quote? You know, they they say war never changes, but each new war they find a new way to kill you. That. Uh, we're, we're, we're all prepared to look for COOF 2.0 or, or super AIDS or whatever's going to come next. And uh, sometimes, you know, that'll just pull the rug out from under you and we're going to have a, a war in the Levant, as it seems, because this has so many ways in which this can go wrong. I and mean, I'm not even just talking black swan events, but it can be uh, missharing of intelligence. It can be taking a strike too far. It can be getting brazen. We don't know because again, this is only just beginning to happen and we're speculating here, but there are ways in which this can escalate very quickly. And I, I have a friend who works in maritime insurance and he had made note that a lot of um areas inside the Mediterranean, as well as the Suez Canal, have some warnings about closures, which I would expect is going to cause a supply chain crisis to both Africa, the Middle East, and Europe, meaning that if you have to go around the Horn of Africa, it's going to take a lot longer of a time, and that, uh, you know, this is just going to disrupt, again, global supply lines. And of course, this is on top of the fact that we're also having a huge you know, budget battle happening here in Washington. You know, we just ousted the Speaker of the House. We just witnessed uh, only a continuing resolution that'll get passed. We've got about 30 some odd plus days now before Congress has to debate again over how to fund the government, quote unquote. So it's just, there are a lot of ways in which this can get kind of, uh, I, I guess, crazy very quickly. And so here yeah. we are speculating. Well, yeah, I would. Uh, on, the, on the crazy aspect too, I mean, you have Israel now in a state of war, you know, to, as far yeah. as I can tell, ambiguously, um, things can get pretty crazy with their Middle Eastern neighbors, depending on, uh, you know, what steps Israel is going to take in the next few days. Um, you know, depending on what happens as well. I mean, Hamas, it de depending on how long Hamas is able to hold against, out against the Israeli military. I mean, they might be hoping on some sort of larger response from other Middle Eastern countries. And like you said, uh, you know, basically some sort of casus belli could emerge pretty easily from from this, um, you know, the wrong missile strike here. Um, and, is, you know, Israel does not respect the airspace of its neighbors, as we know. Um, so there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot that could go wrong here. Yeah, yeah, there is. I think um, in terms of context, I do just want to underscore that that point I hinted at previously, which is that things were very, very quiet in the Middle East before all this business of 9-11. Uh, they really were, uh, comparatively speaking, and they had been for a while. And one might imagine that that made certain new arrangements, um, new relationships uh, possible. And then we saw saw all of that shut down very, very radically and very suddenly with the uh, Twin Towers stuff. 
And uh, from that point forward, uh, Israel had what could be considered a, a, a blank check. Um, and, uh, and the attitude in the United States towards uh, Muslim t- uh, Muslims changed quite a bit, though. At the time, you had people like George Bush uh, the Jr., the shrub, um, getting up and saying, you know, Islam is a religion, religion of peace. Just go shopping. Um, now we have people like Nikki Haley saying, you know, finish them, which is rather interesting. Um, but I, I, there's another aspect of context here. That's neither here nor there. Maybe it's circumstantial. Maybe it has nothing to do with anything. But I thought it was worth observing that we we just heard that everything's quiet there and new arrangements can be made. And uh, and now it's all a big, uh, a big mess again. Um, there's another bit of context, though, which is that the Obama administration really hated Benjamin Netanyahu. And I remember, uh, Prude, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't Obama fly out to Israel and uh, no one met him on the tarmac? Am I remembering I, that I, right? I recall that. And I also, I feel like it's very important to also remember that during Obama's second term, former DNC officials were in Israel working with the Israeli left to oust Benjamin Netanyahu in parliamentary elections. So Obama was no fan of Netanyahu or really Israel in general. And and there's, there's very little question that the same people who are behind Biden were the same people behind uh, Obama. I think that's safe to imagine that you've got, you know, many of the usual suspects doing their thing. Um, And so now we see a situation where, again, providing some context here, as I recall, you know, we looked very closely. I certainly did. And I know you gentlemen did did as well at the business of East Mediterranean natural gas and the Zohar field uh, for natural gas outside of Egypt and uh, the ones that were found around Cyprus and the Goliath field and a couple of other ones outside of Israel and the whole prospect of sending natural gas from uh, Egypt and Israel across to uh, Cyprus, across to uh, uh, Greece, uh, properly speaking, and from there to uh, to Italy, and having pipelines run up into Europe. And then the first thing that happened when uh, Biden came into office was he shut that shit down. And I mean, shut it down immediately. And so there was no more talk of that. So I think it's fair to say especially if we uh, bear in mind what uh, Prude had mentioned earlier, which is the ongoing um, shakeup in Israel with what appear to be standard State Department um, and NGO attempts to color revolution uh, Netanyahu right out of office. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Biden administration is just as uh, negative towards uh, Netanyahu as uh, the Obama administration was. Would you guys say that's fair? Is there anything you're aware of that contradicts that take? Go ahead, Charlene. Oh, I was just going to um, agree with the take. I mean, I think the <clears throat> I think the Biden administration is just a proxy for Obama anyway. So that makes complete sense to me, given that view. I was going, I don't have any, again, we're, we're doing speculation. So I'm just going to go with my gut and not present this hypothesis or theory without any sort of evidence to back it up. But it does feel like there is a whole different class of individuals from Obama's admin that are still in the White House, made Victoria Newland and such. I mean, she's been there since Bill Clinton years. But notice how there was a distinct ethnic acts to grind when it came to Russia from our current neoconservative class of war hawks that aren't like George W. Bush's band of, of war hawks. I mean, you know, if you go back in time, and for instance, if you were to read um, the Israel lobby in 2007 from John J. Mearsheimer and Stephen Wall, he's, you know, they're writing about individuals like you know, Pod Hertz and Bill Crystal, And I mean, these people are still around, but they're far more ready to have that grind axed against the, the Russians and such. Um, whereas the, the concern about Israel really doesn't matter. We'd like to negotiate a deal with Iran, have them have peaceful nuclear aspects there. I think it's to get some kind of balance of power because the Cold War for them hasn't ended yet. You know, a lot of these anti-communists used to be former Trotskyists. And I don't think that they hate them so much for the pogroms. I think maybe they also hate them just because they've managed to fail communism and their kiliastic ideals. But 
there's a there seems to be a, a crop of foreign policy officials and State Department officials that would rather just watch Russia be turned into a nuclear wasteland and Israel is kind of on the back burner. And now this has happened. So we're watching them catch up. Well, here's a quick question. Would you guys say that it seems that the powers in Brussels, just like the powers in, say, New Zealand and the powers in Britain and the powers in Canada seem to be aligned with the powers of the Clinton, uh, Obama crew uh, in, in the United States? Would you think that's a fair assessment? They all laughed, for example, at Trump at the same time. They all um, are into the, the elite training bureaucrat who comes out of the right schools and is advanced properly. They're, they all seem to do everything the same way and to be pretty much on the same page, you know, minor spats and things aside. Those seem to be sets of uh, institutions, uh, the, the European Union, the United States government, the Canadian government. Uh, etc. They all seem to be institutions that have been captured by more or less the same group of people. That's why we talk about uniparties in many of these places, or we see things like Georgia Maloney, where she comes into power, you know, on the promise of dealing with immigration and doesn't really do much in that respect. Would you guys say it's safe to assume that there have been strong ties and, uh, and, um, and uh, synergies, as they like to say, between uh, the deep state in the United States and uh, and Brussels. Yeah, yes, on Brussels. Um, I wouldn't make the same claim about Europe generally. So, it should be clear that I'm not saying that Europe is is uh, synergistic with the American deep state, but it is via Brussels and the European Union more generally, as well as the international financial structures. Um, like the IMF um, that go alongside these things. Yeah, and the UN. And you know, what was interesting is a while back before the EU could be properly described that way, when they did seem to um, butt heads a lot more with the United States, I remember, I think it was sometime around 2009, 2010. And I mentioned this in the past, maybe p other people can look into it and, uh, and uh, disprove or uh, um, corroborate my uh, memory, but I, I seem to recall that there were plans in the European un Union to uh, find a way to not have to get energy from Russia, and uh, it was going to be something like a petro euro, and it was going to involve really close relationships with uh, with Iran, um, and uh, and and that kind of uh, led to a crash in the euro around that time. If I remember correctly, again, it was like 2008 to 2010, somewhere right in there. And then next thing you know, so, you know, that's when the previous um, neocons were in charge. And then you got Obama coming in and it was all about making, uh, making, uh, reestablishing relationships with the Islamic world. And, uh, and not long after he got into office, I mean, a few years, you had um, a joint plan of action in 2013, which was an interim agreement between Iran and uh, the five per permanent members of the UN Security uh, Council. And it was about um, an Iran nuclear deal, which as people have recently been discussing was also uh, a deal that would have opened up uh, once its uh, various aspects were um, observed and uh, the 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 requirements were sat satisfied. It would have opened up Iranian energy, and that would have been right on the uh, right near uh, Europe. It, it would just require moving that energy um, from Iran, probably through a corridor just south of the Caucasus, through places like well, I don't know, Azerbaijan, uh, uh, maybe even Artsakh. You know, could get in the way. Armenia would have a, 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 at least a veto card it could pull, Russia maybe two, and then through Georgia, um, out into the Black Sea, past Turkey, and then it could go into uh, Europe, stepping around Russia by coming in, for example, through a place like uh, like uh, Romania with the Danube and through the, uh, the Bessarabian Gap and the Iron Gates into uh, Europe, or maybe it could go out through the Dardanelles and... Uh, get shipped and a variety of pipelines could be put in place. Um, and, uh, 
And that went for a while. It seemed like it was all going to happen. And then uh, Trump, who had a great relationship with Netanyahu, and you know, Netanyahu always had a really strong um, woof, 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 hawkish kind of stance about Iran, right? But, you know, didn't have a good relationship with Obama, who wanted to open things up with the Islamic world, wanted to open things up with Iran. And previously, we saw technocrats in Brussels around, you know, 2009, 2010, if I remember correctly, who were trying to do things with Iran. But uh, but Trump comes in and suddenly the the successor to the the um, earlier uh, joint plan of action, the joint comprehensive plan of action, it all gets shut down by Trump. I mean, more or less. Um, basically, he, they, he 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 doesn't totally kill it, but he he won't s sign off on it, if I remember correctly. So we've got a Biden administration, and we've got Brussels technocrats. We got the Obama administration before them that all seem to have a background of being really willing to make energy deals that have to do with getting around Russia, that have to do with the Southern Caucasus and uh, energy possibly coming in across the Black Sea, maybe even in a place like uh, Ukraine. And we, have, of course, have the first tremor in the Southern Caucasus with 2008, which is when um, NATO and Soros and other people tried to do to do things with Georgia and Russia responded with uh, with um, the uh, South Ossetia business and the annexation in some respect or another of uh, Abkhazia. So we have Biden and we have Obama and we have Brussels technocrats earlier who all really love the idea of bringing Iran online and using it as a way to get energy into Europe. And that's when they still had Russian energy as well. Now they're in a situation where they desperately need energy from somewhere else. And, you know, there's this weird thing going on with Azerbaijan. You know, what's going on with Azerbaijan is they just rolled in and uh, and pushed with a complete ethnic cleansing, by the way, of the Armenians who had been in Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh for, I don't know, 200 years at least, probably much longer. But it, I could verify that they were 90% of the population at least since the time when the Russians took full control in the 1820s. Suddenly, they've all been pushed out. 120,000 people have been utterly ethnically cleansed from that region, which allows Azerbaijan to move in and take it. You know, there's interesting stuff. There's a guy on Twitter who I do not in any respect endorse in any other way. I think his name was, uh, is it Mike Benz or something? Let me see if I can find him. This was going around today. Somebody sent a link to it. Here it is. His, his name is Mike Benz. You can find him at Mike Benz cyber b-e-n-z at mike ben cyber and he's got a take which i would argue is a pro netanyahu israeli narrative um that uh, it, it conforms very much to mine except he was talking about something i wasn't aware of which was uh, an energy swap deal where iranian oil could come through azerbaijan and of course we know that azerbaijan uh, azerbaijan's oil is now moving uh, along with the Turks, through the Turk stream stuff, and perhaps other routes um, across the the, uh, the 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 area of Anatolia and the Black Sea into Europe, and going to places like Moldova and Bulgaria and the rest. Really, really interesting how Iranian oil seems to be coming and energy. Let's just say energy. Sorry, Iranian energy seems to be coming through Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, backed by Israel and uh, and Turkey, and with certainly the implicit acceptance of NATO in the U.S., just moved in and cleared the Armenians out. Uh, Russia has suffered a loss of face with the Armenians. And they've pretty much got the road uh, from there through places like Georgia or Turkey, in theory, to get that uh, energy out, Turkey being a, a primary one really at present. So Turkey, which has pretty good relations with Iran at the moment, goes in and works things out so Azerbaijan can take some territory. Israeli is a willing participant and assistant. And uh, presumably, if, if, if I understand all this shit correctly, the uh, Azerbaijanis are going to be able to resell uh, Iranian energy. And you know what's very interesting about that? Uh, anyone who knows anything about Iran knows that there are shit cans of Azeris there. Azeris are something like uh, cousins of the Persians, but they speak 
Turkish. It's it's basically the same damn language. I can understand most of it. Where uh, Turks say "ben" for I or me, uh, Azeris say "men," "ben," "men." But otherwise, it's pretty much the the same. It's pretty much the same language. And Persians like to make fun of Turkic groups, uh, which are richly represented within. Uh, within Iran. So Azerbaijan is historically a part of the Iranian sphere of influence. And yet we've got a cleaned up uh, version of post-Soviet Azerbaijan that has good relations with Iran, but good relations now with the West as well. And uh, with Israeli and uh, Turkish support, they've pushed out uh, the, the Armenians, ending a centuries-long frozen conflict with uh, complete ethnic cleansing that no journalists have discussed. And it would seem to sort of clear the way for uh, uh, Irani, <coughs> excuse me, Azerbaijani uh, energy to make it to Europe at a time when it's that much more critical for that energy to make it across that corridor uh, into Europe because we've got an interesting winter coming uh, by all accounts. So that this, to me seems pretty strange. Do either of you are either of you aware of anything about this take of mine about the Obamas and Brussels and uh, and um, and the Biden administration being sort of warmly disposed towards Iran? Uh, are you aware of any of that being false? And by contrast, are you uh, aware or anything that would contradict it? And by contrast, would you see anything inaccurate about the statement that? Uh, uh, Trump came in, had a great relationship with Netanyahu, definitely played up relationships with APAC and the more quote unquote right wing Israeli establishment, and was perfectly willing to start banging the drum about uh, Iran again. Is there anything about those two sort of takes that you would disagree with, either of you? There's a certain degree. No, there's a lot in there that's actually really backs up, historically speaking. Uh, there has been a long-standing push since 2014, since the whole Euromaidan and the annexation, quote unquote, of things such as that matter, um, to divest European energy away from Iran. I mean, this was something that uh, both Barack Obama and the Trump administration and now the Biden administration were really adamantly against uh, Germany and the former chancellor uh, being more pro-Russia, at least with the Nord Stream pipelines. There was the uh, there was an article from the Warsaw Institute, which that brings up so many other questions, back in September of last year, um, back in 2022, that the European Union was pushing for a larger, uh, a renewed agreement with the JCPOA, which was the original Iran deal drafted and uh, negotiated in 2015. It fell back in 2018 with the Trump administration. Um, but one of the things that was pulled out from it was is that the, the deal concluded would return Iranian oil to European energy markets, meaning the EU is once again able to conduct such purchases. The embargo on Russian crude oil, which of course took effect on the 5th of September 2022, removed about 2 million barrels of oil each day. Uh, Iran could first export around 1 million barrels per day to the bloc, replacing a portion of Russian oil. Any partial filling the gap would give EU a relief. However, uh, of course, the JCPOA hasn't really happened. Now we've got the war going on. Uh, inside of Israel, which has been backed, of course, with Iran, or at least the, the claim has been. So you've got those ongoing issues there. Uh, at the same time, I don't know about like right now, like this present moment, how this will play out with, say, Brussels or the European Union or the European member states. We have to keep in mind that this is also in the backdrop of France losing quite a lot of its post-colonial territory inside the Sahel region of Africa, which has been associated either with Russia, uh, Islamic terror groups, or as well as China. And but very, very quickly, ahead, but which also bears on the energy viability yes. of European states via uranium and, uh, and French uh, nuclear uh, power. It sure does. And this is at the same time that you, we've, we've, you and I have talked about this before, and this is from a couple of years back, uh, semi ago, we were on Academic Agents Channel for the Cigar Stream, about just how many pipelines that were flowing through from Iran, from Iraq, from Syria, trying to cross in and sort of bypass Turkey. Uh, not to mention we had the East Med pipeline that was supposed to be from the Israelis um, that would go around into the Aegean by Cyprus and Greece to help support energy trade. Um, and it's something to a point that even OPEC uh, 
considers them to sort of be a competitor to. That, of course, gets canceled by the Biden administration saying no more of that. Um, and now, of course, that's probably come home to roost in the midst of the ongoing energy crises inside of Europe. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's so much going on here that really backs up what you're claiming, not to mention the whole Azerbaijan and Armenia deal, which has kind of broken everyone's brains because all sorts of different parties back one over another, where the U.S. and Iran are on the same side, but India and Israel are on the side of another, uh, and all this over with ethnic displacement, but also with concerns over energy and resource extraction and who gets to agree with who and who has a corridor there. And this doesn't even begin to question the fact that Turkey has been reamping its foreign policy. It has a, a new uh, blue homeland navy policy inside the Aegean and Mediterranean, which causes the Greeks and the French to be concerned, uh, which makes the whole relationship with NATO awkward. They are more present inside of Syria, as well as dealing with Armenia and Azerbaijan, because they're concerned about Russia. And now all this plays out inside of Israel. So again, uh, as Charlemagne was saying, like, the, you know, Israel's declared a state of war, but you have in the backdrop uh, the Afghan Taliban government, you know, trying to get more involved in Middle Eastern affairs as they become a nation. You have the Iran Iranians that have been either openly or, you know, under the table supporting Hezbollah and other groups against Israel, not to mention fighting a proxy war inside of Yemen with against the Saudi Arabians while they've been shooting and attacking U.S. armaments and munitions uh, on top of the you know, what's going on with Syria for the last 10 years, and then all these uh, pipeline deals, energy concerns, the Iran nuclear agreement. There are just so many ways in which this can escalate. Um, and it's it's been a miracle with the Russia-Ukraine thing that it hasn't escalated to any sort of formal degree of war between Western Europe and Russia and its allies. Uh, but this is an entirely different ball game because of so many... Uh, mingling alliances, energy agreements, and people playing against one another for their own uh, benefits. I mean, for instance, France has historically tried to bypass American sanctions to enjoy a, a manufacturing relationship with the Iranians. Yes, um, I um, <clears throat> I do want to um, I do want to return now very quickly to this basic thing I'm sketching, which is you seem to have two factions in the United States. One uh, that is loosely associated with uh, Trump and Netanyahu that seems to want to uh, put the screws to Iran and to limit their influence. And then you have another group that manifestly seems to have a track record of attempting to bring Iran into the fold, particularly as regards energy coming to Europe. And it's uh, it's associated with uh, Clinton, Obama, Biden, and at least during some phases, and I would imagine today, with the uh, Brussels elite uh, technocrats. So we've got one group of people that wants to uh, cause problems for Iran and wants to keep Netanyahu in power. And then we got another group, it seems, both in Israel and in the U.S., that wants to, uh, that wants to uh, bring Iran in, uh, get rid of Netanyahu, and uh, get energy by going around Russia. And I'll add that uh, we see the same sort of thing borne out because Trump is like, we should get along with Russia, right? Now he does want to diversify the energy sources for the for Europe, and he did want he did send javelin missiles and stingers and the rest. But basically, he said we can get along with Russia, and, and certainly he wasn't blowing up Russian pipelines running into Germany. So we've got a war apparently related to how energy is going to get into Europe. And on one side, we have people like Trump and Netanyahu who are playing a careful game with the Russians and not entirely um, alienating them. And then on the other side, we have the Biden Obama Clinton group who just say Russia, 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 who seem to quietly want to bring Iran in. And under the Biden administration, we see what may well be a, a system for bringing Iranian energy in through Azerbaijan, through existing pipelines with Turkey into Europe. 
So uh, I'm just going to give a quick second for anybody in the chat who who thinks that there are serious problems with that general characterization to uh, say anything. Um, and then uh, I'm going to ask you guys one more time if anything else occurs to you. And then I think we can move to context because I think the, the idea of an intelligence failure has to be understood against this background. I think anyone who believes that there's one power and that it's uniform and united in its voice in uh, Israel is mistaken. And I think that anybody who believes that there's one power in the United States at present that speaks with a single voice uh, is mistaken. Um, but any anything else there with, uh, with people uh, in the chat or with either of you? Well, you haven't tied uh, China and their Belt and Road Initiative in particular to this yet. And I'm wondering if you're going to do that. Yeah, I, that depends on how far it depends on whether or not the Gaza people can get over as far as Beersheba, um, because the a major aspect of the Chinese uh, transit and logistics development is this Eliot Ashdod railway that comes up through the Red Sea. Um, and that main line, I think, goes through Beersheba. But what I can't tell for sure, I think there's a second rail line near the border of Jordan further east. Um, but yes, that could become interesting in terms of well, what if what if the the people in uh, Gaza, the Hamas and their fighters, are able to get far enough east to Beersheba to interrupt transit through that area? Um, there's also a, a much larger question, which I, I'm imagining is probably what you were getting at, Charlemagne, um, of well, if it does seem that Biden is uh serving chinese interests at present right then how would china fit into this larger picture of uh of wanting to bring iran online and china has a good relationship with iran um and i can and see Israel. where they would want to yes and china can get uh all kinds of things going in terms of answering its own ne energy needs through um Iran. I'll throw in one more complicated piece because I haven't thought all this through. This is where it gets really hairy, this specific aspect that you brought up. And uh, I suspect that's precisely why you brought it up. Um, there's an additional dimension, which is Iran and Russia seem to be cooperating quite closely. Russia and China seem to be cooperating quite closely. But uh, if Iran uh, moves into this position, then they are uh, they're going to be um, causing problems ultimately for Russia in its view of how things should go in the future. But Russia needs Iran at present and Russia needs China at present. And so these uncomfortable allies, I think, are looking at each other and maybe agreeing to some things face to face up front, but uh, doing their own business in the background in terms of uh, um, backroom deals. So I, I don't know how to fit China into this fully at the moment, but I think that the business of Iran coming online under a Biden, Obama, Clinton, Brussels type plan uh, would not make uh, Russia happy. However, Russia and Iran seem to be cooperating and Russia, uh, if it has any sense, is going to want to not alienate Iran at present. Likewise, Russia is going to not want to alienate China, but China is getting its energy from Russia at present, largely. And I, Iran is not fully online yet. And so China doesn't want to fully piss off Russia. So I think there's a lot of uh, skullduggery going on. Um, but that's my sort of first take out of the gate. Again, this is all speculation, ladies and gentlemen. Prude, yeah, the, this is it's, it's always fun doing these streams because these could either like find wine or milk very quickly. Uh, it is funny, though, that uh, China did get mentioned. I'm glad that you mentioned it, Charlemagne, because Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, uh, who is famously uh, pro-abortion in America, but not so pro-abortion in Israel. Uh, he's in China right now uh, in Beijing, and he had urged Beijing to use its relationship with Iran to not have the uh, escalation unfold. He, uh, quote, I raised with President Z the unfolding atrocities carried out against Israel and the need for the world community to stand together against terrorism and with the Israeli people and pointedly requested from President Z that the Chinese foreign minister strengthen their statement um, 
Uh, they did, Chuck Schumer said in a statement. Uh, initially, um, the Israeli embassy in Beijing had said that they expected a stronger condemnation of from uh, of Hamas, which they did not seem to, to show. They wanted more Chinese solidarity. We have to remember that China and Israel do share a pretty strong economic relationship. Um, there are there's a double tax treaty with um, these are to contain the exact tax mechanisms that are deployable between China and these respective countries, in this instance, Israel. Um, they're pretty valuable because they can be used to reduce taxes and uh, upon agreed upon products. So it's a reduction of tariffs to offset um, how much of your profits are going to be cut back in terms of taxes um, from there. Uh, in a lot of maps, when it comes to, say, the, the Tehran Meshad Railway, um, you know, you have China's import export bank lending about $1.5 uh, $1 billion um, USD for electrification of rail lines to help improve communication, to help improve its uh, transit systems. Uh, a lot of the maps that I've seen when it comes to the Belt and Road to tend to avoid Israel. And I kind of can see why for obvious reasons, especially with the ongoing hostilities. But uh, I'm not surprised that they were slow to condemn Hamas, considering uh, the, the strong relationship between um, China and Iran. However, of course, China is a large investor in Israel, of course. Um, you know, they've uh, had estimates about $200 billion needed for foreign direct investment to meet the population's real estate in Israel. Um, this comes from the Silken Road briefing. This is from uh, June of, uh, of 2019. So this is a few years old. But uh of course, the Belt and Road Initiative tends to avoid uh, Israel, although uh, I'd imagine that depending on how things flow here, that may be subject to change. But on paper, at least, China and Israel enjoy a, a good trade relationship, but the amount of infrastructure investment that comes with the uh, BRI, not so much. Maine? Uh, what the heck is a U.S. senator doing in China? Don't answer that. We all know the answer. <laughs> um, yeah. Isn't that like an sure Article is. Two breach, though, for him to be conducting foreign diplomacy? Uh, I mean, not that that matters. Sure, sure is hard for him to address the the senator, the uh, uh, you know the uh, Congress, you know, with that with that fucking dick in his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, all of this too has to be taken into the context. Um, you know, as Thomas uh, likes to point out, 777, that is, uh, you know, the, the U.S. government is, uh, you know, um, structured to fight the Cold War. And these people are still mimicking fighting the Cold War, except now they have uh, a, a particular ethnic grievance involved <clears throat> against Russia as well. And uh, that, that's what all of this is about, is isolating Russia from Europe. Uh, you know, the United States views Europe as its sort of staying area to wage the Cold War against Russia. So, you know, there's no <clears throat> there's no way they can allow Europe to come to some accord with Russia. And there's also no way they can allow Europe to gain energy independence as well and, you know, threaten to become a, a major power on its own that could challenge the United States, which is, you know, why the U.S. is setting up this, this Rube Goldberg, perhaps literally Goldberg, uh, machine to deliver... Europe, it's energy that makes it completely dependent on uh, the United States uh, enforcing this framework as well, because this framework we're talking about on how to get energy into Europe clearly has nothing to do with Europe um, or its own opinions on where its energy should come from, as we can see with the various uh, pipelines that have been shut down by either party and, and um, you know, the, the distances um, being undertaken to actually deliver energy. Uh, to Europe. Yeah, I think we're uh, well said, and I, I think we're we're at a point now where we can begin to look at the what does this really mean? Of course, we hinted at it. I, I of course, wanted to railroad in, you know, shoehorn in my take, which has to do with uh, with the full acceptance of the idea of the hypothesis, convincing one at this point for me anyway, uh, that there are there's more than one faction in Israel and that they're in a bloody uh, fight to the death. Uh, maybe not even just metaphorically speaking now, you know, with the, the criminal charges against uh, Netanyahu that I've heard about in the past. Um, uh, 
it seems that the same group that wants to get rid of Netanyahu is the one that wants to make sure that Trump doesn't come back in and wants to make sure that there's no Northern Hemisphere cooperation between Europeans and uh, and Russians, for example. Um, uh, so it does seem that we've got two blocks who have uh, different ways that they want to play things. Uh, but as Charlemagne brought up with his excellently timed question about China, we can't really think about it in this way. And I guess this kind of goes to, to what you were saying, Charlemagne, about um, Thomas 777's, uh, 777's points uh, about uh, a Cold War, which is fundamentally a binary arrangement, a binary way of thinking. And what we have here is a tripartite framework uh, of uh, China, Russia, and the US, as Tim used to talk about very often on the channel. So we're trying to think in binary terms, which comes very easily to us. We got male and female, despite what some people might say. We've got left and right. We've got up and down. We've got black and white. You know, we've got forward and backwards. We've got two ears, two eyes. You know, we're, we, we use this uh, division into pairs to, to conceive of everything, which is one of the ways that, um, or one of the reasons for uh, why uh, commies tend to worship the dialectic, because they just love, uh, you know, uh, binary systems. They're just very straightforward and simple to understand, never mind the fact that they, their explanatory value is uh, um, highly questionable. So China is, 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 is a piece that we have to think about further here. I have not fully gotten my head around it. But if we assume that we've got two groups reflected in, uh, in the United States and in uh, Israel, and that they have uh, different things that they want to achieve, and if we can all agree that... Uh, Netanyahu wants to stay in power. Netanyahu wants to develop more energy independence and energy income for Israel. And, uh, and Egypt is actually kind of on board with that in a number of respects because gas coming out of Egypt could run through any infrastructure developed for uh, uh, Israeli or even um, Lebanese uh, gas fields, as well as uh, ones that are potentially Cypriot. Um, if we assume that by uh, that, Netanyahu wants to stay in power, that he wants energy, uh, income, and independence for Israel. And uh, on the other side, the Biden group wants to shut that down, get rid of Netanyahu, because he stands in the way of Iran coming online as an alternative source of energy, potentially via Azerbaijan, or perhaps more explicitly as a potential source of energy, uh, alternative energy, um, relative to Russia then we have a group that would really want to take down Netanyahu. And then we have a group that would want to back him. And in theory, though I wouldn't say it's black and white like this because we have to think in terms of threes, and we also have to think in terms of governments that have to quite sensibly back, you know, place their bets on more than one party because they know it doesn't always go the way they think it's going to go. Nevertheless, it seems to me that you've got Netanyahu wants to stay in power and the Biden administration that wants him out. I would have to assume that Netanyahu has certain uh, elements of the national security and intelligence apparatus that are loyal to him and certain parts that are not. I would have to assume that at present, the relationship between the Five Eyes and Israel is rather strained. So now we turn to this question of an intelligence failure. I wanted to cover all this first because an intelligence failure, quote unquote, doesn't make any sense unless we think about that. And, and I have to also underscore that an intelligence failure here would, would not just be Israel. It would be the five eyes. And so everybody's talking, well, how could Israel have not have seen it? Well, what about everyone else? What about the CIA? What about MI6? You know, what about the, the NSA and the, you know, the various agencies associated with the military with, you know, three letter names, US military. Um, so when, when you look at it that way, it becomes much more interesting to me. Uh, particularly, I've been watching Judge Napolitano's YouTube channel. He's got uh, uh, sort of cadre, you know, the veteran intelligence professionals for sanity, you know, like, 
uh, Ray McGovern and, and, uh, and he's got, uh, people like, you know, Scott Ritter who can't stop humping Russian legs. Um, he's got people like, um, he's got people like, uh, uh, this, uh, some, some female former military intelligence person who's actually quite articulate and intelligent. He's got, uh, Alexander Crook. He's who is a former spook and ambassador, uh, you know, if, if they're ever former and all these people come on and, uh, it's kind of tuned for a libertarian sort of MAGA crew. And Tony Schaefer is another one. And, uh, I've been listening to what Ed Douglas McGregor is another one, the, um, among the best of them. And all of them poo poo the idea that this was really, you know, a, a failure for the Israelis. There's just some shit you can't see coming. And, you know, this sort of thing just happens. Although I think Schaefer has been a little bit different with it, where he's saying that it suggests that there was a, a coordinated effort on the part of some state that is backing Hamas to feed false intelligence to, uh, to Israel, but he stopped short of saying who that was. You know, it occurs to me, it's very interesting to imagine a scenario in which that would be the United States. And that brings me to the idea that what we're seeing here could be, this is all speculation, ladies and gentlemen, we could be looking at a situation where the Biden administration decided that this was the best thing to get rid of Netanyahu because all of the right-wing people and the, the, the ones in the sort of marginal um, border uh, settlement areas who are more religious and more aggressive about Israelis taking territory and who are therefore more likely to settle in the immediate vicinity of uh, the Gaza Strip. Those are the very ones who would see this as a shocking intelligence failure that would destroy Netanyahu's uh, credibility and destroy the coalition that he's clinging to power through at the same time that he's taking all this color revolution shit uh, in the neck. Um, so from that perspective, you could see, well, wow, maybe there was a, a failure there because Five Eyes resources were turned towards making this happen in the same way that, you know, the Endowment for Democracy or whatever other fill-in-the-blank NGO has been involved with State Department money in attempting to take Netanyahu down now for months, if not years. So on the, you know, I, I came to this straight out of the gate thinking, well, this Kui Bono, this benefits Netanyahu because he can turn and say that there's a, there's a situation where, um, the Israelis need to stand together. They've been fighting amongst themselves. And now while the, the stiff necked, uh, factions are butting heads one with the other, the entire country is falling apart around them and they need to turn to a strong leader in war, um, but now I'm tending to favor the idea that um, it was uh, two things happening simultaneously. And I base that in part on the Judge Napolitano stuff because these typical guys are trotted out to say that, uh, oh, it couldn't have been an intelligence failure. You know, it wasn't anything like that. These things, they just happen sometimes. Um, I'm thinking with an organization as penetrated, you know, it's like the old joke about the clan about how it would go to business. If the FBI members stop paying their dues, I'm <laughs> thinking about Hamas and you know, the number of people in intelligence services who are in Hamas, you know, providing information. Well, how, how could is Israel not have known? So now I'm thinking to myself, well, I thought straight out of the gate, that Netanyahu would be the one likely to benefit, but I'm hearing the people over on Napolitano's channel saying, yeah, I don't expect, uh, I don't expect um, Netanyahu to be in power much longer. Some of them were careful to hedge and say, well, he's going to be in for a little bit longer because they're going to want to, you know, uh, circle the wagons around a strong leader. But, you know, this is a total failure on his part. And I'm thinking to myself, mm, depends on how he spends it. If he can show that there were uh, parties further afield who were attempting to destabilize Israel through this, um, then he could just galvanize his uh, right-wing support. So anyway, my, my basic idea now is that uh, the Biden administration and people of that sort want to take Bibi out because he gets in the way of Iran's slow and uh, sub Rosa um, integration into the energy networks. And uh, Netanyahu, I cannot imagine, I simply cannot imagine that he was not aware of this, that he just said, look, it's going to happen anyway. 
So I'm going to go ahead and let it happen in a way that shocks and appalls everyone. And now suddenly, as Prudentialist was talking about, we're getting to hear about the threat of uh, jihadism again, which is uh, something that I'm sure the Biden administration is not interested in hearing about. I'm sure the people in Brussels who are bringing more and more Muslims in every year don't want to hear about this. So my take, here's my hot take, ladies and gents, is that this is a situation where, and this is very preliminary, this is highly speculative. I'm not making a prediction. I'm just telling you what my current take is, um, is that uh, this was designed to take Netanyahu out and uh, that accounts for some of the intelligence failure. And then on the other hand, uh, Netanyahu said, bring it on. I think I, you know, God gives you lemon. I'm going to make fucking lemonade. And uh, I, I can turn this about on them. You know, turnabout is fair play. What do you, uh, what do you gents think? Yeah, I agree 100% uh, with that take, actually. I, I think that's a very good analysis. I think it uh, comports with what Netanyahu has said and his, immediately, his immediate actions uh, following the disaster as well. Uh, in order to uh, support what you're saying there, I would expect him to go... Um, you know, balls to the wailing wall and, you know, basically implement the one state solution uh, <laughs> uh, and implement the one state solution uh, with the Israeli military. I mean, that, that sort of seems like what they're gearing up to do. I mean, let's, I mean, mobilizing 300,000 reservists for, for this attack. I mean, that's a little, yeah, I don't know right? that part, that part though. I, I, I'm going to draw back on because what we heard today from some defense official in Israel was that they were going to lay siege to them. And I think the Israelis are crafty enough to know that they're not going to win in any respect if they attempt to move in. Now, they may in certain areas, but they got they got fucked a bit when they tried that last time. I was there and I was paying attention to it. It did not go well for them. And if they uh if they simply go and surround it, then there are other ways to spin it. I, I'm I'm not going to say that it's easy to to try to you know polish the turd of a the two million people in the size of Detroit strip of land with no power and no food and no water, but it's much easier to manage that in terms of public perceptions and uh, the the potential for the involvement of surrounding Middle Eastern countries than it would be to go in and just fucking plow it under. I saw I a thing in the chat earlier. I mean, we, we've seen... Yeah, uh, I don't think they are. They'll, they'll, get, they'll get fucked. Yeah, no. Uh, we, we saw how modern urban warfare plays out in uh, Bakhmut, for example. And of course, these Hamas fighters are far more experienced at this sort of thing uh, than, you know, the Ukrainians were. Um, so, uh, you know, predictions of like Blitzkrieg and stuff didn't work out so well for Ukraine. Uh, but what I'm saying is like, even, even for some sort of siege, right? Like an army that size is, um, I mean, that, that sort of indicates um, a level of commitment to sieging Gaza that would uh, like dwarf what you would consider like a, uh, uh, like a, uh, not equivalent response, but what's the language for, for something like that? I don't know. It, it, it seems to indicate to me that uh, Netanyahu is, is serious about, you know, putting, uh, bringing the Gaza to heel. And, you know, I'm sure they would go in eventually, but probably not after uh, a protracted siege. Um, and, you know, we have to consider the other parts of the country as well, which might be what, you know, this, yeah, proportionate response is, as Mandrell said in a, Chat. I mean, uh, mobilizing three hundred thousand people is not a proportionate response. So the question is, like, what is the what is the response gonna? Well, gonna it depends. It depends on what you do with those three hundred thousand people. It, this seems like a good point to to. Well, with three hundred thousand people, you could you could lock down Gaza from the rest of the planet. I mean, no one's oh, yeah. getting in or out. Abs know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but I, I do want to underscore again this thing that I was hinting at earlier, which is, you know, you've got people flying in on ultralights being talked about as an air force. You've got people with outboard motors on rafts being talked about, you know, their, their leader being talked about as director of naval operations. You've got Netanyahu calling this, you know, war and declaring war. And... I mean, let's again, I, I've never, has anyone heard about like groups of people larger than like seven or 10 or maybe 15 anywhere? 
in, ter- in terms of like the size of the battles being fought the size of the units of uh hamas that are spreading out and and re- raising hell no i haven't seen anything about that um actually it might be a good time to uh bring up that jimmy thomas uh thread i think you mentioned you wanted to go through that about artillery yeah we should do that um but l- l- let me quickly say there's one other thing i want to put into in to, to, to consideration here i've been watching fetty mapping because i like him he's got good stuff on uh on the the business going on in ukraine you know very interesting thing about him though is that uh, as i heard him describe you know he posts at weird hours of the night um suggesting he's in a different country and i did notice as he's talking about different cities in israel he's got really great pronunciation of all the names of the cities i'm like wow i wonder why he's got such good pronunciation of all of the names of the cities as 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 though those names are ones he's familiar with in his native language um Fetty mapping talks about you know how various cities have been taken you know and and i just i just want to make sure that everyone understands that Hamas hasn't taken any cities. None. It has control over no cities. None. What it has is the ability to disrupt things, to kill people, to raise hell, to burn shit and break it. But it doesn't control any cities. And so I think that must be borne in mind. The the size of the groups of people that are involved uh, on the Hamas side, in terms of the independent units, I think all this bears on considerations of artillery. So bear with me. You know, the size of the units involves the claims that they've taken over cities. Um, all of that is, um, all of that, I think, is a bit much, a bit breathless, uh, as it were. But yeah, there's, uh, let me see if I can find it over here. Can I share this screen? Let me first find uh, Jimmy Thomas' thread. Because one of the things, well, maybe you can lay it out, uh, Charlemagne or Prude. Basically, there's been a bunch of talk about how, you know, removing the shells from Israel has created a problem for them in terms of their ability to prosecute any kind of war further in Gaza. Um, I'm going to look for his thread if you can say more about that that take that I think Jimmy was responding to. Uh, okay, yeah, I can uh, pull it up right here. Uh, on my phone i I do want to add real quick to the intelligence failure question i I think that there is a lot of good reasoning based on history of the last three administrations especially the more democratic ones to remove netanyahu and one of the first thing this was a gut reaction after uh, my brain was just thinking there's no way in hell you have Mossad of all groups not to mention five eyes have an intelligence failure i mean they, they can, obviously, but I mean, it just seems too good to be true, especially for a country that is constantly in sort of a borderline schizophrenic state of concern about its own existence, that it would it would miss this badly. And I think about Trump, obviously, and how its own military officials, Mark Midley and all those other traitors, uh, lied to Trump about the state of how many troops are in Syria when they lied and said that there weren't any troops in Syria and so on, that there is potential for that. And so my brain is just thinking he's doing mass mobilization. He's declared he's got a state of war that he wants. And what would be better than to have an Erdogan moment, to have an attack happen, to, to claim this and to basically clear out your military and political enemies. But those are just some of my thoughts there. But we can go to Jimmy's thread here. Sorry, that was uh, uh, Netanyahu. Yeah, like I was thinking about Erdogan in the 2015 election. Yeah, I think that's. That's that's a fucking great parallel because it seems that it was the United States. Uh, well, let's say it seems that the United States could have been behind that coup if Erdogan himself was not behind it. Um, or it, it, and those are not mutually exclusive takes, just like what we're discussing here. And I, yeah, again, prove that's a great thing to bring up because that was the tool that Erdogan used to consolidate his situation in the face of attempted, you know, a- attempts from Western powers to unseat him. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah really I mean, good analogy. Cause there's so many in America, especially from the, the Biden Obama camp. And I mean, it's really Obama's foreign policy guys that are still in place and it's a new 
and this is a guy from my chat who follows, and he made a point a few weeks ago. He says the reason why the Ukraine war is so important is because it's a new class of the foreign policy uh, establishment that's sort of taking over from the global war on terror group. And that's why this war being prosecuted by a proxy with Ukraine is so important because it's a part of their new agenda rather than the old sort of cold warrior, global war on terror, radical jihadist side. And I mean, that includes Israel in a lot of ways. Like, the, this is more of a Eastern European ethnic bent that would love to see the destruction of Russia and Slavs, whereas it used to be more about uh, Israel and the sort of old classic neocon position, which was, as Max Boot said in like 2003, what, what is a neocon in the Wall Street Journal? It's mainly a foreign policy thing. It's mainly about Israel. And so now you're kind of seeing these old neoconservative versus you know more eastern european total slavic death ethnic bent of this sort of class of state department trying to clear things out and they're kind of fighting but yeah i really do think that if netanyahu was intelligent about wanting to stay in power and i think it's very clear and obvious that he does that mobilizing 300,000 making a total example out of you know the gaza strip and hamas and hezbollah and to say screw it any idea of a western two-state solution and just own it while at the same time clearing out your military clearing out your political opposition clearing out your quote your own israeli version of the deep state yeah i'd do this too right uh to me it just makes the most sense especially in the midst of yeah. fighting factions in the state department about getting rid of them. yeah and to uh to sort of open up the the game board to any number of uh heretofore impermissible uh, permutations. We can't forget that what just happened in Azerbaijan was a complete and total uh, unilateral ethnic cleansing of something that had been going on for 200 years, at least b beyond that. But like it, you know, in, in our more modern history for 200 years. So we have a precedent that was just set where a huge group of people were just not, well, not 2 million as we have with the Gaza Strip, but, you know, I don't know, 120,000 people were just, you know, railroaded out of their homes and pushed out and their, their uh, you know, their own leaders arrested as terrorists by the Azerbaijanis. And Israel was involved in that. And now we've got a situation where, if I'm right, if this hypothesis holds, it's very tentative, it's early days, you know, your mileage may vary, don't, you know, you get what you pay for, fuckers. You know, this is free content. But um, you've got uh, uh, Netanyahu, presumably the Biden grouping is trying to take him out. He wants to stay. I can see where the Trump grouping would want to help him. And so you could expect them to begin squawking about interesting things in short order here. I would expect that Russia would actually be interested in helping them. Um, though they'd have to be very quiet about it due to the the delicate nature of their relationships with Iran and China. Um, you could be seeing a situation here where, you know, he's, uh, he's going to turn it around. Now, I don't think he's going to go into Gaza. But if uh, you were looking for a set of pretexts to make your complete ethnic cleansing of a region more uh, acceptable you know, heaps of young people's bodies from music festivals and a uh, precedent that was at least implicitly uh, endorsed um, or uh, or uh, approved, I should say, by, uh, by NATO in the West from just, you know, a month before of ethnically cleansing a region that had been in question for 200 years, that would sort of set the stage for... Uh, Clearing Gaza. I just don't think Netanyahu's stupid enough to uh, to try to do it. Um, very quickly, um, this is uh, this is a thread from Jimmy Thomas. He has a YouTube channel. Um, he has great information on uh, things like the operational level of warfare and uh, many uh, other angles. I highly recommend his channel. He just basically went through a, a thread here. You know, Israel certainly has enough munitions for Gaza. The real question is where the West hits a breaking point in munitions production in response to escalating conflict. Uh, number one, the West is expanding shell production to about 10 times pre-Ukraine levels, but the timeline is 2025-26 for that. Uh, second point, 
Israel hasn't given any munitions to Ukraine, uh, non-lethal aid only, at least that we know of, I'll add. Uh, but for indirect fire, they have 155 millimeter artillery and 120 millimeter mortars. Um, the U.S. held 300,000 shells in Israel for U.S. Middle East operations and emergency use by the IDF, but the U.S. sent them to Ukraine in January 2023. Yeah, that's an important the, point because I've seen this take going around. I don't know where it came from that Israel is out of shells or something where they gave most of their shells to Ukraine, but that just didn't happen. So I'm not sure. Yeah, that was U.S. shells that they could have uh, uh, availed themselves of, but uh so, you know, there is that, but it's not their own stockpiles. Um, they say the IDF then ordered under uh, 100,000 shells from a local supplier that are expected sometime in 2024. That's about how many shells IDF compatible, how many IDF compatible shells were in U.S. stockpiles that could have been made available. Uh, so the IDF has a one year shortfall in their contingency stockpile. Uh, no op open source knows the IDF's stockpile of shells after the U.S. transfer to Ukraine. In the 2014 Gaza operation, uh, they used about uh, 800 per day. This one will be larger, 1,000 to 1,500 per day. Uh, might be more accu accurate. He qualifies that as a ballpark guess. Yeah, well, that, they that, can then that run assumes that they sort of launch a full-scale military assault on Gaza, uh, which we don't yeah, know. Yeah, which, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, maybe in two days we'll see that I'm completely wrong, but, uh, I tend to doubt it because it's playing into their defensive strengths and it's going to make, you know, all the hand wringing and, you know, wailing and, you know, funeral footage, um, appear everywhere. Um, but Thomas goes on to say they can run high intensity ops in Gaza for one to two months without international help and keeping an emergency war stock. However, there are a few problems. Israel only has 155 millimeter for artillery, which is precisely the shell you can't get because of Ukraine war demands. They can backfill uh, 155 millimeter artillery with mortars. Uh, mortar uh, bombs are in less demand than 155 millimeter shells. Uh, I would also add, if I'm not, not mistaken, they're probably more suitable for use in um, in the valleys of uh, urban combat between buildings than perhaps artillery shells, but I don't know quite enough about that to say that with certainty. Anyway, he goes on to say Gaza is tiny, so their short range is irrelevant. Their relative inaccuracy uh, resulting in collateral damage fits into the category of things we cared about a week ago. However, the IDF has limited mortars. U.S. has a mortar to artillery ratio of one to one, but the IDF has one to three. Uh, and he says, number four, the real question is when the Rust, uh, West, when the West runs out of the ability to supply munitions to its proxies and allies. Uh, Western countries are increasing shell production by ten times, but that's on a 2025 to 2026 timeline. At that rate, they could only supply current. Uh, Ukrainian and Israeli consumption. So if uh, Ukraine stops its offensive in the next month, uh, Israel completes Gaza operations by 2024 and there are no new high intensity conflicts, then everything will be fine. But if Russia launches a major offensive while Israel is still engaged in high intensity ops, or if a new high intensity conflict starts before mid 2024, then the US needs to make some very tough decisions. Armies with fewer shells take more casualties and can't conduct offensive operations. So I thought that was worth putting in there from a, a staff officer's uh, perspective. Gentlemen, any thoughts? Well, if I can just say, you know, how I think this conflict is going to proceed, you know, what I expect to happen is uh, the reason Israel has done this mass mobilization, um, calling up its reservists, um, this is probably to secure its borders um, so that they don't have, you know, that, like Hezbollah or any other terrorist groups or supplies, um, you know, bringing in people or munitions from outside of their borders. Uh, and then I would imagine the, their, their um, standing army is probably going to focus on cordoning off the Gaza Strip. Um, I doubt we're going to see any massive invasion of Gaza, but that's possible. I don't think we're going to see... Uh, Netanyahu do anything particularly ghoulish because he's not going to want to piss off the West when, you know, you have this sort of uh, Trump faction, or at least 
a plus GOP faction like backing him at the moment. Um, so he's not going to want to do anything that's going to piss off the West, but he's going to want to act decisively, and he's going to want to you know solve this problem in a very permanent way. So I might I I, I we might see a particularly brutal and uh, prolonged siege of uh, Gaza, uh, but I doubt we'll see a sort of direct ethnic cleansing. Uh, like just happened in uh, Armenia, or at least uh, immediately. So that's that's sort of my take. I, I don't think we're going to see like the high intensity conflict um, that um, Jimmy Thomas, you know, talked about, not necessarily predicted. Um, I don't think we're going to see that. Prude. I don't know if we're going to get a a high intensity conflict. I, I do think that we are going to see something very similar to what may have taken place in. 2006 and in 2014 when it came to fighting i mean not not in respects to fighting hezbollah or going into lebanon but i mean that level of conflict and engagement um in maybe larger numbers dealing with hamas i mean i don't think that they're going to to raise the gaza strip or anything like that but i do see that israel has enough domestic capabilities to thwart this insurgency they're going to want to maintain their borders and maintain an aggressive posture to uh, disincentivize Iran or any other terror groups uh, getting involved. They have already made threats uh, against Damascus and uh, Assad's government saying that if Hezbollah gets involved, uh, it doesn't matter that they're in Lebanon. They're going to raise hell in every neighboring state like they have in the past. Uh, how well that this can be a- executed, I do not know, but I-, I think that Thomas's points are very cogent and as a, as a former staff officer his opinions on the war both here in israel as well as ukraine are well uh good for our your audience uh semi-agog to pay attention to but as it unfolds i think it does illustrate that hey there's a strike group carrier in the mediterranean that's moved closer to provide assistance uh whether that's sharing intelligence or providing ammunition i do not know uh i I think it's a really big warning sign to other powers and parties in the Middle East that you are inviting uh, America to get involved in the Middle East again uh, if you attack that carrier group. And if, you know, America may not be uh, the military that it once was 20 years ago, but at the very least, it has experienced individuals that know how to prosecute conflict in the region that they've just spent the last 20 years being in. So. I don't think that they want to invite U.S. troops onto any soil in either Israel or in uh, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, because Benjamin Netanyahu sure as hell doesn't want U.S. boots on Israeli soil. That would be a huge political humiliation. for him. So I, I think we're going to see this be executed primarily, if not 100 percent entirely, with Israeli hands, arms and blood and treasure. There will be, of course, intelligent sharing, but. To me, it does seem like Netanyahu wants to maintain his power and will use this uh, invasion, this attack, by any means necessary to maintain that. Yeah, and uh, maintaining an aggressive posture, like you said, uh, makes sense as well, because although the the mobilization doesn't seem proportionate to what happened, uh, Netanyahu is kind of putting his chips on the table, uh, so to speak, in terms of, you know, if you if you if you perceive this as a moment of, as a moment of vulnerability, um, you know we're we're prepared to attack you. We're going to deal with this problem internally, and if anyone from outside the country wants to get involved, you're going to pay the price for that. And not to mention, you know, as as the president uh, who now has war powers, I mean, in terms of what he can do to uh, maintain his power, putting the the mil- mobilizing the military. Um, is something he can do to, to put chips on the table um, on his side. It's at least a piece on the board now he has available. Um, you know, and it makes sense why he would have done it immediately too, because maybe in a few days, uh, you know, depending on what happens, the moment might be gone. But he, he took advantage of the moment to, to get the war declaration and to, to mobilize. So there is that. Yeah, I tend to think that Netanyahu is going to use this. He's going to try to turn it inside out and use what I think is a direct assault on him and his uh, power relationships with a view to bringing Iran online and, you know, having more of a a, a rainbow party in Israel. 
Um, I think, uh, I think he's going to turn it around to his own purposes or has placed his bet on the idea that, um, that's his best opportunity and it's going to be done to him in any case, which I would assume he would have known about in advance. Um, if I'm wrong, well, well, let's say this, if, if uh, Netanyahu stays and increases his standing and resolves most of his issues, then, uh, then I'm right about that. If, uh, if he goes, either I'm wrong or he failed. Um, but I, I think the other aspect that we need to look at very closely is this whole thing of Iranian involvement. If Europe and Biden and the rest of them really do want to bring, bring Iran in and to uh, bring them online, then the last thing that Iran would want to do uh, because uh, contrary to all expectations, I don't think Iran or any of the other Arab countries give a flying fuck about the Palestinians. I don't think they ever have, and I don't think they do now. They may respond in certain ways based on domestic audiences, but I, I don't think they give a shit. Um, they don't care about, you know, uh, uh, the Iranians don't care about much about their own uh, Shiite population. In many respects, so why should they care about Sunnis somewhere else who want to uh, uh, want to dispense with them as heretics? Um, and for that matter, I don't think the Sunnis uh, care that much either. And if you want to see how well Shiites and Sunnis get along, look at the uh, the 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 Shiites. I think they're what fivers, the fiver Shiites in Yemen, and what they've been going through with uh, with the Saudis. Um, so. I do think we should look at what uh, Iran does. I mean, this whole business of a few sort of perfunctory shellings, performative shellings across the border from Hamas, excuse me, Hezbollah, excuse me, Hezbollah uh, at the outset of this. These are the kind of things that happen on and off all the time. And uh, occasionally, um, uh, something develops out of them. I think it was cross-border raids and maybe some kidnappings and some tunnels that precipitated the shit in 2006. But so far, we're not seeing Hezbollah do anything. And and uh, we haven't seen Iran do anything, nothing that I'm aware of uh, thus far. So if I'm right, Iran staying out of things would fit with this, uh, with this picture. The big question to me would... Uh, would be what happens uh, what happens with Netanyahu any thoughts on that gents one of the things we didn't touch and I think it, it's kind of maybe two things I want to bring up one the amount of armaments that have been sold or given as aid to the Ukrainian government known for its corruption prior to the ongoing hostilities as of February 2022 uh I'm sure some of that ended up in the hands of either Hamas or other terror groups in there. And of course, Vladimir Zelensky had said today, um, we have very clear data proving that Russia is interested in citing a war in the Middle East, the new source of pain and suffering would erode global unity and exacerbate cleavages and controversies helping Russia destroy freedom in Europe. Um, and of course saying that it's Russian armaments that are selling it. Um, that tranny uh, Michael Ashton Cirillo, the one that was taken out for calling the death of U.S. senators for questioning American aid to Ukraine, had said, please be prepared. The Defense Intelligence Unit of the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine is proof that Russia's already believed and delivered Western weapons into, from Ukraine to Hamas. Uh, now they're planning to use and stolen smuggled trophies to manufacture false accusations against Ukraine. Don't assist Russian propagandists in spreading these uh, allegations. And to me, that just says, um, well, if you're pointing at the other guy in the midst of alleged uh, Javelin and other NATO equipment being in the hands of these terror groups, it makes it sound like someone in Ukraine probably sold these weapons to various uh, terror groups. So uh, that's an important yeah, let's thing not, to let's, let's not forget all the shit in Afghanistan, much of which was seized uh, or sold, seized by or sold to Iranians. Yeah, and then the second thing that is, of course, on everyone's mind, and I retweeted it earlier uh, this week, and it just broke out, Morgoth's law applies to all things. Uh, wh whatever happens in this conflict, there are going to be a bunch of people from the Levant that are displaced and will somehow find themselves moving to Europe on some kind of migrant boat or extraction. So 
uh, whatever happens, uh, Europe needs to be sure to point them with the force of a gun to get out of their countries. Yeah, good, good, good luck with that. I want to come back to that, but I want to give uh, Charlemagne a, a point, to, uh, a, a place to jump in here if there's anything he wanted to add. Uh, no, let's let's talk about this more. Okay, well then, the thing that stands out for me is remember Netanyahu was was out of power. He was the leader of the opposition when all that shit happened in 2006 and uh, Israel didn't uh, perform very well against uh, Hamas. And then he came in uh, within the next two or three years there um, and everyone thought he was out and suddenly he was back in again. I mean, not entirely suddenly, three years or whatever is, you know, that's some time. But, uh, well, actually it was in the summer, so maybe two and a half years the summer, I think, was when that business with uh, with uh, Hezbollah happened the first time. And I might have just mis misspoken again and said Hamas instead of fucking Hezbollah. Um, but if, if I did, forgive me. Anyway, he was out of power and the humiliation suffered there uh, served to elevate him in Israel. And he returned for this long streak he's been uh, back for. Um, also, back when um, this business happened with the Twin Towers... He was in power right up to 1999, and then he just temporarily retired from uh, politics. He subsequently served as a senior consultant with uh, Israeli communications equipment manufacturer BATM, Advanced Communication, for two years. And then uh, he expressed a desire to return to government, and then uh, uh, he... he uh, he comes back in as a minister of finance in uh in 2003 and then became leader of the opposition so he was out for a while nevertheless uh, his group his interests um did very very well after the business with uh, the twin towers so there's there's no smoking gun there. There's not even a clear circumstantial picture, and people who know more about is Israeli uh, politics um, uh, are very likely um, people who who can explain that I've missed some important point there. Doubtless I have, but it does seem to me that if Netanyahu doesn't know something's coming and gets out of the way to let it happen so that he can't be smeared with it, it's at least uh, possible if not likely. Um, so he seems to me somebody who's uh, able to roll with the punches and engineer circumstances to his advantage. Um, and so when we take a look at this business, I've carried forward that hypothesis or, the, or uh, that view of things, I should say, as regards the possibility of it people are trying to screw him and he's like, you know, fuck yeah, let's go for it because I think I can do more with this set of circumstances than you imagine. And in fact, be strengthened by what you think will weaken me. Um, but again, maybe we'll see him, maybe we'll see him be out of office soon. Um, and, uh, he'll either, uh, have failed or I'm completely fucking wrong. However, against this background of how, it seems like everything's going to be quiet in the Middle East and then something huge flares up. It seems like we haven't heard any talk about jihadis in ages. Now we've got a situation where the airwaves are full of imagery, maybe not as full as they could be. And that's an interesting thing to consider. You know, in the past, we would have seen even more about uh, this business with Israel. And we had a, you know, a lot more in the way of New York Times pieces and and uh, progressive talking heads decrying what was being done. These days, we're not seeing that much, but we're still nevertheless seeing lots of footage of people being just gunned down and all kinds of uh, howling from, I don't know, I think about accounts like Amy Mech. That's one of those major pro-Israel accounts that likes to go on constantly about the threat of Muslims in Europe. I'm not saying, of course, that there's no threat from Muslims in Europe, quite the contrary. But I am underscoring the, the idea that this is, you know, this is a channel for the distribution of a particular message based on particular interests in the case of Mech's account. And so there's a lot of... Uh, 
press out there, again, there could be more, but nevertheless, there's a lot of press out there currently about how savage the, uh, the, the, the Hamas fighters are and how this calls for the most aggressive responses. And what if, what if Israel does do something? What if Israel, uh, under Netanyahu's leadership, does do something that throws um, that throws uh, the the Muslims in Europe or the United States into uh, into a hissy fit? You could very, very, very quickly see shit get funky in Europe very quickly. I mean, especially if you imagine things like Algerians and uh, people from the Sahel being pissed off, both which are Muslims, by the way, being pissed off in the France at the same time that, uh, you know, Palestinians and others who are in Europe and other Muslims who are in Europe get uh, deeply pissed off about things. So you could see... Um, you could see some very interesting things happen in terms of creating domestic problems for countries that are giving him domestic problem problems initiated by Netanyahu based on his knowledge that actions he took would lead to uh, upheaval that would ca cause domestic problems in Europe, in Canada, in the U.S., uh, and other, other, uh, other places of the sort. Any, any thoughts on that, gentlemen? Uh, yeah, I thought about this uh, earlier today. I uh, sent a tweet at uh, Gunter Fellinger um, asking this question because uh, he was he was blaming you know the the KGB or whatever for for this event. I guess I guess the question is you know like if uh, we have these if these populations exist in Europe that can be you know manipulated by like uh, KGB instigated attacks. Um, in Israel, which, you know, isn't what happened. But I guess the point is, like, why why do we have these populations in our countries that can be remotely agitated by events going on in completely different countries uh, where their, you know, ethnic brethren or their homeland is, right? Well, it's a very dangerous situation, and Israel's response can definitely uh, set these people off. We've already seen a number of protests and you know, the usual agitation in all these countries. But in Europe, it's a pretty different story because Europe does have a uh, serious uh, Islam problem, um, both from Africa and the Near East uh, and Middle East. And, uh, you know, these people can actually be set off if Israel does something crazy. I mean, maybe that, uh, you know, there could even be some intent by certain factions to cause that to happen as well for their own reasons. Um I noticed that with Canada today that um, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, the bastard child of Fidel Castro, had made a rather pro-Palestinian uh, public statement. And it did make me think in the backdrop of this, you know, post-national Canada that, you know, millions of people have come in in the last five years and the population size of Canada is roughly the same as California's, which is unfathomable to think about considering just all the immigration that they've dealt with. That at any point, in, and also in, in New York, you had the, you know, Israeli, you know, supporters clash with the pro-Palestinian supporters in New York City and Times Square and protest. That at any point in time, how this war goes, or if a public statement is said, or if a Western leader does something, these ethnic groups are taking biological weapons for riots. Like, imagine that France offers military aid to Israel or offers intelligence or conducts an airstrike or whatever. I doubt that they do this, but say that they do. All of a sudden, uh, every single Arab in there is going to to riot and and turn that you know turn cities into to you know flaming hellholes whenever they riot when they tend to. So there's this huge implication that because of all the demographic and the migration issues and all of these foreigners that shouldn't be in these countries, there are now bombs that could go off literally and figuratively any time that a Western power does something pro-Israel uh, at all. And even today, we just saw that because. I know some people like him, some people don't, for whatever reason that they have. But Tucker Carlson was sort of criticizing the, you know, the warmongering rhetoric of those like Nikki Haley. He had Vivek on for some reason, but Trump's points were rather cogent, like the borders undefended, hundreds of thousands of people die from fentanyl overdoses and act like zombies in the streets as homeless people. 
that matters way more to me than some war in Israel, you know? So I, there's so much that could make this uh, a domestic crapshoot, and we're watching it play out right now in America and the West. Yeah, this just brings me back to AA's point about how, you know, they could, uh, and, and when I say they, I'm implicitly assuming at least two factions that are at odds. So in, when I say they, I'm not just talking about a uniparty. Um, factions represented uh, both in the West and in Israel. Um, you could see them, one or the other, or if their interests coincide both, um, throwing a wrench in the works in terms of uh, upheaval in Europe. But I tend to think that that would uh, very much benefit uh, a Netanyahu uh, Trump uh, group more so than um, than the Biden ones who want to see that uh, stabilize. As broader context, I want to bring in something here about this idea that we have any number of frozen conflicts that now seem to be uh, being approached. And uh, at least in the case of uh, Artsakh Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, resolved unilaterally. And the way I think about frozen conflicts is it's an economical way to just take the, the square off the board for a time because the competing powers cannot reach a resolution there. And so we've seen them in a number of places. We've seen them in, uh, as I said, after South Ossetia, you have uh, South Ossetia and, uh, um, God damn it, Abkhazia, as, uh, and, which is a considerable proportion of the territory of Georgia. They're now frozen conflicts, which is probably why Georgia's watching its fucking ass right now, trying not to piss Russia off and not making military investment. And despite all the NGO activity, is not showing its ass relative to Russia because it doesn't know what's going to happen yet. And it's already been slapped once. As I said, it lost a great deal of its territory. Another one is, uh, well, let me check over here. I've got a, I got one article I pulled up about Abkhazia that I should check. Where is this one? This is uh, Givi Kvarchia, military base is a double-edged sword uh, protection and threat. Um, basically, the Abkhazians are talking, I think, I haven't read this fully, but the Abkhazians are talking about the possibility of getting uh, Russian military bases there and further recognition. I think they're just like recognized now by Russia, Venezuela, Syria, um, but this little tiny country that I'm sympathetic towards, just for full disclosure, because they're a, a, arguably a kind of Circassian or the cousins of the Circassians of whom I'm fond. Um, they're, they're talking about a Russian military base going in in this area of Georgia. So we could see a frozen conflict of sorts with Abkhazia sorted by uh, Russia coming in and just formally annexing it and uh, end. Uh, South Ossetia. We've got this business going on with Transnistria. My personal hypothesis is that, or one of my hypotheses, is that the, the stuff going on with the Ukrainians incomprehensibly attempting to advance across these muddy uh, islands covered in undergrowth in the Dnieper, the lower Dnieper, um, that they're they're actually uh, just trying to uh, advance their positions in anticipation of a potential Russian assault towards Odessa if um, Moldova slash Romania slash NATO on one side and Ukraine on the other try to take Transnistria. So again, we're seeing this theme of the potential settling of uh, frozen conflicts from the past. So we just covered Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh. We covered uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. We just covered Transnistria. And another one that I saw that someone uh, with a proper sense of anticipation, Alabaster, just mentioned um, uh, Kosovo, which I've looked at. And indeed, Alabaster's right. The Brits, as well as other NATO countries, have sent uh, peacekeepers there because there was some sort of... Uh, some sort of protest or uh, acting out on the part of uh, Serbs in Kosovo. And as a result of it, the circumstances are not clear. One Albanian 
or Kosovar, let's say, police policeman was killed. Uh, a number of the Serbs were killed. Um, originally, they were talking about a couple dozen people. Now they're talking about how 50 or 60 of these terrorists were attacking. And, you know, they've trotted out the Kosovo security people to talk about, you know, how they... Uh, how they believe in democracy and everything else, and they're just trying to defend the human rights of the Albanians um, while attempting, it would seem, in a slow and steady way to unilaterally settle the frozen conflict there as well. And I would say that very likely up for consideration is some business with the Kurds uh, as well. So... I think there's something going on here. Part of me wants to say that there are two competing factions leaving outside the business of China and the fact that any attempt to break it down into two competing interest groups is going to be uh, inadequate in terms of explaining what's happening. Um, but I have not yet fit China into this picture fully other than assuming that the Biden administration is working with them in order to drive Russia into uh, China's arms because China has been the real beneficiary of the Ukrainian war. Um, but I do think that there's something maybe happening at a higher level, which is before we move to a new phase of stability with the new pecking order arranged, we need to settle these frozen conflicts, which, um, have existed for quite some time and are getting in the way of, uh, business, uh, particularly the movement of energy, uh, I can't remember if it's trans or cis Caucasia, whichever um, the the area south of the Caucasus is, um, which is a, a major energy corridor, also the uh, the Black Sea. So I think everyone should be aware of that. The idea that we may be seeing um, a time where everyone can get away with just unilaterally coming in and uh, bulldozing populations out of places that they've clung to for quite some time, whether that be um, Ar Armenians in Artsakh or, uh, or Palestinians in Gaza, uh, alternatively, or, or, or uh, Russian-speaking um, Moldovans in uh, quote unquote Moldovans in Transnistria, or you could see Russia come in and say, not just no, but hell no. And they put bases in uh, Abkhazia and formally annex uh, South Ossetia at the same time. So that's just a major theme I wanted to tap there. Uh, any thoughts from either of you? Um, well, another angle we can look at this from is, uh, you know, the opening up of a new front in this war against Russia that, that could be the, this could be the beginning of that happening. And obviously there's sort of precedent for this sort of maneuver in the way the Anglo-Americans fight war. Um, you know, we can think back to the first world war and the whole, uh, Gallipoli front that they tried to open, obviously the first, uh, engagement between the, um, Americans and the Wehrmacht uh, was in North Africa. Um, so it's quite possible that in the war against Russia, they're trying to open up a second front in some oblique way um, that will reveal itself um, down the line, um, given that the events in Ukraine are not going so well. Or I guess, as you say, it could also just be unilateral um, solutions to frozen conflicts, um, uh, which is is something we could see as you know we with everything happening in Africa and the Sahel region, you know now this and the Armenian situation and Ukraine, uh, you know given that um, people are realizing that you know Russia's tied up in Ukraine and uh, America is no longer a superpower that can project its will anywhere on the planet, you know there's a lot of room to just sort of clean house. Prude. One second, Chance. Well, while we're waiting for him to come back in, I'm just going to scan through here. Um, Alabaster notes that Turkey has begun bombing the Kurds again. And so there's questions about what's going to happen in Syria now. It's important to understand, as I've discussed in the past, that Syria and Lebanon also have <coughs> uh, territorial waters in which, and exclusive economic zones in which they can claim. Uh, 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 natural resources off their coasts, uh, energy resources. So there's, uh, 
there's that that to consider Syria has to be considered because actually it fits in with everything else. It's another one of these frozen conflicts. You know, I did mention the Kurds, but I should more explicitly talk about Syria. And there's uh, the increasing alignment, it would seem, of Iraq now uh, with a large Shiite population with uh, with Iran. You back yet, Prude, or should I move on to something else while you... No, you're, you're good. I think one thing to keep in mind is, is that the rhetoric just a few days ago out of the more neoconservative camp in American politics was, you know, if Ukraine doesn't win, like what message does this tell China? And now you've seen there's sort of a panicking about, well, like if you really wanted to stress test the American hegemony, you know, something happens within the Davidson window sooner rather than later with respects to Taiwan. I don't see that happening right away for obvious reasons due to Chinese uh, still manufacturing a lot of their Navy and that they're typically not so gung-ho to act instantaneously. They're rather reserved. But I'm curious to see how that digression will play out in the American camp now. Uh, yeah, Turkey is striking at the Kurds again inside Syria. There's still a lot of, there's still U.S. forces in Syria. And it just, it's interesting now because there's a lot of Iranian, Iranian political influence inside of Iraq. Uh, they kind of took advantage of sort of the political weaknesses of Iraq during the Islamic State crisis during 2014. There's a lot of Iranian influence there in their politics. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. I just, again, the I don't know what new sort of uh, peace will look like under this new order or whatever, if it's to come. But it's indicative to me that I don't, you know, the American style of just throw money at the problem and then let's hope we can negotiate because we keep throwing money at it. I think that that's not going to be the one quick step solution. You can only use amoxicillin so much before the bacteria becomes resistant to it. And I think we're entering a new phase of how these kind of politicking from the West towards the Middle East plays out. Right on. Yes. Um, the only other thing that, uh, well said, the only other thing that I would throw in is, um, well, there are a couple closing thoughts, but prior to that, um, the only other thing that really stands out for me is uh, the, the question of this relative to Ukraine, which is something that a lot of people want to talk about. To me, it's a secondary interest. I, I, don't, I don't think of a war in Ukraine, or the, the the civil war in Ukraine, as any kind of isolated or independent thing, I think about it, about it uh, against the background, as indeed many people do and should, uh, against the background of uh, the Biden camp, Brussels, NATO, Atlantic powers, etc. Britain certainly um, wanting to uh, separate uh, Europe from Russia. For people who are interested in some ideas related to that, please see previous streams I've done with these gentlemen and others uh, regarding the uh, Promethean strategies. Um, but, it, but, but certainly we should at least give some thought to if this will affect um, arms supplies to Ukraine. It certainly seems like uh, it will or even already has. Um, and... Uh, and how this a split focus at a minimum will serve as a, a nice circumstance for Biden and company to say, hey, look at this, not at that. You know, if everything's going south and turning to shit in Ukraine, which it could very quickly, um, you know, do we have uh, do we have a great uh, excuse here? Could uh, could Biden have and, and company have imagined that this was a great way to turn the attention of the world to something else as their previous project falls apart? Yeah, that's a good question, because this is happening amidst a sort of conflict in Congress that may all just be theater over funding to Ukraine. And, you know, we have, you know, senators like Josh Hawley and others calling for ending all the aid to Ukraine and sending it to Israel instead. That's presuming that Israel even needs aid because we have no idea what the scale of the conflict is even going to be at this point. Um, but, you know, that's interesting. Is this going to, is this a distraction from uh, the failure in Ukraine? Is this actually going to dampen um, efforts uh, from the Biden administration in Ukraine along partisan lines? Uh, it could, uh, again, it could go either way. I could see 
this sort of helping serve as an off ramp from Ukraine because now this other issue is coming up, or I could see it as actually um, harming, you know, their actual intents to continue supplying Ukraine, presuming that those are there. I'm just, this totally resets how American foreign policy is going to operate. Uh, I mean, Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela just is today he said that it's all Israel's fault. And I mean, this is Venezuela and we just resumed deporting is uh, Venezuela nationals back to Venezuela. I just, and you throw this on top of Chinese investment into South, Central and South America. They are heavily invested in, for example, the lithium triangle because we get most of our lithium from Australia. They can't really do that anymore. They can't play in that market. And they also invest in CELAC, the sort of anti-American alternative to the Organization of American States. And they're far more pro-Palestinian than they are if they've ever been pro-Israel. Um, in fact, you know, the recognition of Israel as a state uh, Uruguay changed their position on, um, not Uruguay, uh, or yeah, Uruguay, but not Israel. They changed their position on Taiwan due to Chinese money. So I just, I'm, there's so many areas and influence that this can change how the, the usual expectation of America throwing money at things can change. And I mean, look at the, when the war started with Ukraine and Russia, for example, look at the 35 countries that abstained from the United Nations General Assembly vote, places like India, places like um, South Africa, uh, Turkey, and the rest of them. Those tell me where to see the fractures play out. And I imagine we're going to see a United Nations uh, vote in the General Assembly or something come up soon about this ongoing war. And how those votes play out are a really good example of where sort of the politics lay. And whether you know the theaters continued there, I just saw an article from Politico saying that congressmen are debating how to tie Israeli aid to Ukraine aid. So there's sort of this dual front that can be maintained for, for the United States government. It just, there's sort of the, I think there's just a, a fracture point somewhere in the U.S. State Department that is really ready to crack and make its face more public. I just don't know when we're going to see it. Yeah, and you could certainly see all kinds of grand, and I do mean grand, political theater in the United States surrounding Trump and the uh, the subversion and degradation of our institutions and all the rest. Um, and it certainly would seem uh, that if now is the time to do that, certain elements of the uh, U.S. intelligence services, certain elements of the um, the Israeli ones and, uh, and likely a considerable proportion of the Russian ones would come together to support such a, uh, denouement. And even if we're talking about my minority groupings of the intelligence services of those three countries, and even if you assume that there would be like Chinese and American and British elements and the rest that would be very much against this. It's still something to consider. Like, you know, if you have Russian intelligence and uh, factions within Israeli intelligence and uh, factions within the U.S. intelligence who really do think that Biden and his crew have gone too far, if indeed they weren't just set up to be pathetic little stool pigeons in the first place. And every time I look at the face of somebody like a Blinken or a, a Newland or a Biden uh, or Kamala Harris, or indeed any of them, I just, I see the face of a slobbering patsy, a wealthy one who's done well uh, based on, you know, raising their ass that high into the air covered with glistening grease. But, um, but I do see the faces in potential of uh, suckers and patsies who've been played by people who understand uh, the great game better. I don't know that that's going to be the case. I've been um, greatly disappointed in the past in my predictions, and I've publicly eaten crow about them. So, you know, make up your own damn minds. All of this is just speculation and very early uh, speculation, but that that is something to think about, particularly when you throw in the business of the the possibility of how all this could be carried uh, forward into um, into uh, domestic upheaval in European countries with uh, um, Islamic or Muslim, I should say, populations showing their asses in rage about what's happened there. Um, it could be uh, could be very very interesting indeed. 
Um, Lance Corporal Veteran has been trying to get a question through to me. And hello, sir, by the way, asking about Chinese Belt and Road projects in the Levant and um, whether there would be associated connections to current events. I think ultimately there could be. I mentioned that uh, there have been at least negotiated deals. I don't know if they finally went through, but for uh, the Chinese to be able to ship stuff up through the Red Sea to uh, Eliot and then transfer it uh, by rail across Israel to uh, Ashdod. And Ashdod is, by the way, one of the, the settlements that's in the range of threat zone right now in the Gaza envelope. Um, I believe that there's been uh, deals cut or at least promises made about funding set aside for the Chinese to help out in Syria. Um, Prude would probably know more about that. Um, do you have any um, anything come to mind immediately, Prudentialist, about Chinese investment uh, in the eastern Mediterranean there? I do know that they've wanted to, their, their plan would be to have ports that go through uh, Syria as well as Turkey and Cyprus. Although, again, all three of those areas are kind of major hotspots right now because they would love to get uh, rail lines through from Ankara to Eskihir to Istanbul to Erdine to get into, you know, Europe, but also to have a, a ports in Antalya, which would also be connected by rail from uh, the city of Konya, which is south of uh, Ankara. But at the same time, you know, Syria is still in the midst of a war, um, although Russia has control of that port, so potentially there could be more development in there. I guess it's the question of how do you secure it. Uh, what's This again was in 2019. Um, this report I'm reading from. Turkey's largest foreign direct investment did come from China. Uh, and this is because China acquired the Turkey's third largest port, which is um, Comport in, uh, so in Istanbul. And they are one of the larger container operations. Uh, Costco Pacific is also there that they purchased. So, I mean, there's a lot going on in the Levant, not just Turkey. Um, there's been investment in Syria how you can make that work in places where Damascus is currently fighting a war, especially in the North East. And then Cyprus, of course, heavily divided, cut in half. Um, I, I don't know how much this investment will pay off. I guess it really does depend on who wins, you know, the, the Syrian conflict in the long run, but I don't see that war coming to an end uh, at least for another five years. Right on. Thank you. Um, well, at, at this point, I think it, I should emphasize that all of this is the most rampant radical speculation. Uh, all of this is very early. Um, I've certainly been um, dramatically wrong in the past. These are all just speculations. Um, but this is a channel where uh, we like to do that. We like to speculate. Uh, because that's how you get your brain going and throwing out uh, different scenarios and possibilities. I think as regards my current view, which is that it's most likely a uh, Biden-backed faction or Biden's handler-backed faction is going after Netanyahu to finally get rid of him and provide a distraction from the, the, the farce that's... Uh, unfolding in Ukraine at this point, the bloody and tragic farce that's unfolding in Ukraine at this point. I think they're going after Netanyahu and he has decided to uh, take it, turn it inside out, turn about is, turn about is fair play, as they say. And uh, he thinks that he can make hay with it. Um, but we'll have to see. Um, the very interesting parts for me are how Russia can't, greatly risk its relationships with Iran and China at present. Likewise, Iran and China don't want to greatly threaten or call into question their uh, relationships with Russia because of uh, pressure that's on them. Though in the case of China, I think it's faux pressure. And just for the record, I don't think fuck all is going to happen in Taiwan. I think Taiwan is a, a tar baby. It's a fucking pinata that everyone can <laughs> smack at and talk about. I don't think anything's going to fucking happen there. No, I, I, I agree. It's, uh, it's a scarecrow. 
China's perfectly happy with the, well, not perfectly happy, but China's content with the existing relationship with Taiwan. I mean, I think the only thing they really want is for Taiwan to be more clearly within their sphere of influence on the world stage for, um, you know, honor reasons. Um, but, you know, I think they're perfectly happy to have Taiwan as a pseudo separate country that has its own, um, you know, highly productive economic system that isn't under the the sort of party thumb. I mean, I don't I don't see why they would uh, they would be up. And the with banking that. opportunities, they just got rid of the, the, the angle they had there in Hong Kong for that. So they need it, you know. Yeah, no. But, so, uh, yeah, the, the whole making a fuss about Taiwan and like, oh, China's going to retake taiwan because this or that's happening or ukraine it's like that's never going to happen they're why would they want to do that they like taiwan just as it is really all they want is a, a more um a globally accepted standard that taiwan is in their sphere of influence and and not the americans and i think that's really it well then uh i guess uh this is a good point for you guys to bring up anything that might have been missed anything that you wanted to cover and uh, relative to the very last sort of topic that was brought up, if there there's anything that you wanted to add as regards how this might affect uh, what's going on in Ukraine. So uh, basically, this is sort of open section. Anything that you wanted to cover that didn't get covered, um, lay it on me. Uh, maybe uh, Prude? I don't know if I have anything else to add. I just think that the real big thing that I there are three things that I think out of all the speculation that are really big through lines that will need to be investigated in the coming days. One is going to be how does Netanyahu prosecute this war? Is this going to be something that we saw in 2006 or 2014 with Lebanon and Hezbollah? Are we going to see something literally like it was 50 years ago in 1973? This is the first time it's been uh, an actual declaration of a state of war since then. You know, he, he's promising threats. So the first thing that I would say is that we need to pay attention, and our audience needs to pay attention. I'm sure we'll report on this in the future, how the war is being prosecuted and what is he doing that's any different from previous counterterrorism activities. Number two would be how does the rest of the Levant respond, especially since there is a U.S. carrier strike group in there. What does Iran do? What does Syria do? And what does... Um, Lebanon and the rest of the Middle East play out because this is not if Israel does something the rest of the Middle East is going to watch and that includes Egypt so you need to be paying attention to how they do three those things and their responses to it because I don't think anyone wants to go to war right now especially because of what's happening in Russia and Ukraine uh, third but um, also really kind of important what does uh, the USG do in the midst of its funding battle? This could all be kayfabe, but it still is important to see how a cash-strapped and also munitions-strapped country provides support to Israel in the midst of maintaining its, you know, best money we ever spent kind of uh, logic from homosexual rent boys like Senator Lindsey Graham. Uh, so how would they respond, either with intelligence or not, needs to be there. And this is all in the overarching umbrella that needs to be further investigated as time plays out. We may never know, much like 9-11 and other things. How did they manage to not see this coming? Um, but those are the, the four-ish things that I think are important for us to pay attention to in the coming weeks. Yeah, I, I certainly, um, it's, wor it's worth reemphasizing as you did this business of them not seeing it coming. I think it's pretty clear that none of us buy that they didn't see it coming. My, my explanation is that uh, it was a combination of uh, <clears throat> hiding it on the part of, uh, you know, pro-Biden factions in the Five Eyes intelligence services um, and uh, willful blindness on the part of, uh, of uh, Netanyahu because he figured it was going to, A, it was going to happen anyway, and B, it was, it's likely that he can turn it to his uh, purposes. Um, and that th this brings up one other thing you mentioned, the declaration of war, and I'm glad you did because there was something else I wanted to mention earlier when we were talking about how, wow, they declared war on it, you know, and I don't know if this is really a Navy or an Air Force that Hamas has, but they declared war. Um, I would love to hear from Israelis or people who are knowledgeable about such things about what powers um, are suddenly unlocked or 
Netanyahu in circumstances where he is the head of state declares war versus those that he might have been limited to prior to the invocation of that condition or state. I think that's something that's very much uh, worth our consideration. And I'd love to hear from people. You can get me on uh, my Twitter account, DM me, or just tweet it and uh, include my tag, uh, because that's something um, I think we should all think about. But Charlemagne, yours, sir. Well, uh, I think you you two summarized pretty well, but just on the question of how it will affect Ukraine, I think it really depends on you know, what the actual motivation for starting this conflict was and what the involved parties are going to do. It could end up having no effect whatsoever on that war. Um, that's not to say that it doesn't fit into an overall larger uh, scheme, but uh, as far as affecting the war, I mean, affect American arms shipments to Ukraine, you know, no, not unless maybe the GOP uses this as a sort of moment of leverage to squeeze the Biden administration further on that, as they seem to be doing. Um, or if the U.S. does end up sending, you know, massive military aid to uh, Israel, assuming Israel needs it, which I don't think they will, because as I already explained, you know, how I think this is actually going to play out in terms of what this war is going to be. Um so I, I can't I can't really see any direct impact on the war in Ukraine at the moment, but I think in a, another week probably uh, we'll have a much better idea of uh, whether or not there is going to be some ramifications there. So that's all I uh, can really add for on that at the moment. Right on. Well, uh, thank you both gentlemen very, very much. Uh, before we close, it's time for y'all to shill what you got going on with, uh, the old glory club. You know, what do you have going on with your sub stacks before you tell me, I just want to say to everyone who is listening, thank you for listening, but definitely go and subscribe to these guys do so, uh, please on YouTube, uh, do so on Twitter, uh, do so on uh, Substack. I see my buddy Jolly Scholar is in the house. Hello, friend. Um, but yeah, Charlemagne, Prude, uh, whichever of you wants to go first, uh, shill away. Sure. So the Old Glory Club is going to be doing some uh, film reviews in the month of October on Fridays uh, uh, as a paid podcast uh, post in lieu of our written content. Um, I'll be operating one of those with Raging Mantle and with uh, Thomas 77 um, as a guest discussing the film Prometheus. Um, I know you and I and D and guard are about to watch and discuss the exorcist. I have no idea if that's going to end up being content for us or not, but whether or not it does, uh, we have uh, other plans as well for uh, our October podcast. Um, if you want to become a paid subscriber over there and uh, yeah, that's all I have to show. Oh, and someone did ask about, someone asked in chat about my Axis and Allies uh, tutorial videos. They do exist. I'm not sure if they're uh, public or private at the moment, but uh, I'll I'll go unprivate them if uh, they are actually hidden um, when I get a minute. So, yeah, that's all I have. Right on. Monsieur Prudentialiste. I see your, uh, your your froggish woman is rubbing off on you with this accent. But uh, yeah, it's always fun to see Charlemagne's Access and Allies videos pop up on my recommended feed. They're like, you know, videos by people you watch. And it's like, cool, I'm all for it. Um, I would love to just simply shill uh, and promote my our friend Last Things. He is a, a great content uh, and essayist on film, television, and why... Uh, you know, these sort of metatextual things matter in terms of literature. He is doing a sort of fall autumnal themed um, film festival, Last Picture Show. And he and I will be discussing uh, the Kurosawa film Red Beard and numerous other friends of ours are going to be with him doing various film talks, including George Bagby, the distributist and others. So I would love to promote him. And then, of course, um, you can find me over on my YouTube channel just as the Prudentialist. You can't miss me. Just look for the frog. Absolutely. Do it, people. Follow Charlemagne. Follow the Prudentialist. Uh, please, if you're not following uh, my channel, uh, consider subscribing. 
I will be producing content, as they call it, uh, more regularly in uh, coming weeks. So yeah, please do subscribe. I also want to say Last Things is a good guy. I hope to be able to uh, participate that in, uh, in that as well. I have to figure out a film and a date uh, before I can get back with him. Um, and I should add that my uh, friend Frody, Guide to Culture, is doing his Decameron Film Festival. Yes, there are at least three of these things happening. Um, and I'm definitely scheduled to uh, get on with um, Frody. Uh, I'll be talking about the movie Happiness by Todd Solons, I believe, which should be uh, a barrel of monkeys uh, to, uh, to discuss. Uh, so definitely keep your eyes peeled for uh, Frody's uh, Decameron Film Festival. I've participated uh, a number of years previously, and, uh, and it's great fun. Uh, but I should also add, as pointed out, Last Things is a good guy, and I may be able to get in uh, with him uh, for his as well. So yeah, I'm I'm sorry that I have not been around uh, recently. Um, for those who came in late, uh, I mentioned this at the outset, I've had some paying work that I had to jump on. Um, however, I remain very, uh, very grateful indeed for the people who do support my channel. And, um, and for all the people who have bothered to subscribe, I hope that you will all uh, consider doing that. And check out my books. They're linked in the description below. Thanks to Charlemagne and the Prudentialist again. I'm very, very uh, grateful that they were willing to set aside their time to talk with me tonight. So yeah, uh, to mods as well. People like Zedez and others. Very happy to see you here. Thanks for the help in the chat. All of you, thank you very, very much for being here. I am Semiagog, and I am out. <laughs>